not only is he a writer, but he's a director, he's a producer, he's also known in the business as a showrunner. Please help me welcome the incredible, wonderful, talented, exceptional writer, Danny Kalis. What is your writing process like? Like, let's say you have an idea and now you're going to create a script. I operate out of the gift of desperation. <laughs> okay. It takes a certain amount of motivation combined with some strategic procrastination to finally get me to write something. So do you wait like two days before you have to turn it in, a day before you have to turn well, it in? Well, let's start with the fact that I'm... I'm much better when somebody's paying me to write it. Okay. Let's just start You're with that. You're more motivated. I'm very motivated okay. when that happens. Okay. But it didn't start that way. Okay. You know, it was waking up in the middle of the night after having dropped out of law school and staring at a cottage cheese ceiling, having just had dinner with one of my friends who had started at some firm at 30000 a year, which was a lot back then, and thinking, oh my God, I've ruined my life. And then um, I just kept writing spec scripts, and I wrote a movie script that sucked. It really started, certainly for me, with writing about something that I knew, which was the great American where I had worked. And that's what I often tell, you know, new writers, or young writers, writers you know, which is the obvious, write what you know. Uh, or some version thereof. Right. Why should they not write about something they don't know? Because a lot of times you go, well, why can't I write about... You, you absolutely can. I, I, I don't mean to suggest that you can't. In fact, for many writers, that's, that's what it is. Usually some, somewhere there's a connection to who you are, what you are. Something, even if it's fantastical and has no relationship to your life, there is, usually it comes out. Mm -hmm. in the writing. But that's something you can look at after the fact. And every writer is different as to what their process is. I do a lot of thinking. I do. I, I would come up with my best ideas when I'm on a trip, when I'm driving, when I'm showering, when I'm... I mean, anything Away other, from the other than <laughs> sitting there at the computer. So how writing. do you capture it? When oh, I, I, I make notes. I okay. jot things down. Truth of the matter is I practice telling my story a lot. Oh, okay. Well, I'm thinking of doing something like this, and then I tell the story. And the more I work at it, the so more it starts... So you're pitching it before you've written it. I, I, by the time I sit down to write it, I can usually... It can take me four years to come up with something, and okay. I can write it in four weeks. Okay. It's marinating. It, it's it, simmering. And, and, and you're working it. I mean, that's the other part, is, is practicing your storytelling craft is trying it out on people. I mean, but every writer is different. I remember when I started on Silver Spoons, you know, I was very deliberate. I wrote very detailed outlines. And, and I was working with this guy, Jim Gagan, who ended up uh, being a lifelong friend as well as my co-writer on creating The Sweet Life of Zack and Cody and on deck. He was the co-creator. But we started together on Silver Spoons. I was wow. there the first year, he came in the second year, and we had these selectric typewriters. I remember, uh, right? them I remember well. the little ball, you yes, know, I do. And, and you would type, and, and it would be, you know, chikadoom, 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 just furiously <laughs> popping off of that uh, uh, cylinder. And uh, Jim, I would describe as a pure writer. I mean, he just had to write. He gets up every day and he will write, and he will Jim write Brooks. jokes. No, no, this is Jim Gagan. Oh, okay. Jim Brooks. Uh, very quickly once said to me when I asked him about his writing when he was working on a movie I said what's a good day for you and he said two pages <laughs> that's, that's two good. pages yes if Jim Brooks can sit down and get himself two good pages in one day he felt wow. like he had a good writing day that was Jim wow okay uh, with Gagan, I mean, like I said, every day, and he would write jokes, he was a stand, I mean, but he was always working. So we would be given our assignments, sent back to our rooms to work. So we had a, a, an attaching door between our two offices. We shared the same floor with the Jeffersons, by the way, at that point. So I'm in my office, and I'm writing my script, and I'm sitting there going, you know, chick -doom, chick -doom, and it had those erase yes. things. Remember, we could go back yes. like a line. Yes, yes, yes. Right? So I would go, strip. little strip, right? right? So I would go, chick -a -doom, chick -a -doom, chick -a -doom, ding, and then I go, and I'm always releasing, you know, meanwhile, Jim's next door, and all I hear 
is chikadum 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 ding chikadum 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 ding chikadum, and he never stopped, not for an hour, not for two hours. Finally, after the umpteen chong chong with me, I just threw the door, but I said, "Aren't you done with your goddamn script already?" And Jim goes, "Oh yeah, I finished it an hour ago. I'm working on my play." I hate you. I hate you. And that was the beginning of a beautiful friendship. So every writer's process is different. I, I look. If you get to fade out, in my book, you're a writer. If you get to the end, now go back and rewrite. You know. What be, did you say? I said, now go back and rewrite. Say that one more time. Rewrite. Rewrite. Okay. So you come up with an idea, you mull it over, you share with a lot of people. You're you're basically just storytelling, and now you are ready. Well, let's start with the the assignment because that's where it starts and if you're not getting paid or if someone's not giving you the assignment then you got to give the assignment to yourself okay so what's the assignment all right the assignment to get started is you need a spec script if it's tv you know if you're going to write a movie then you need to write your movie and uh, if you're writing a spec script then you're writing for a show that's already on the air right so all the work has been done for you the characters have been created the conflict the situation the tone of the show, everything is there for you. But like I said, as a showrunner, I'm killing every week to get a new story. So if you can walk in with a story for me, you have made a sale. That's what I'm looking for when I got all those episodes to do. Because um, your writers will document I'll give it, it to whoever okay. did it. I mean, we're always going to rewrite. It's okay. always going to change. So in my case, I wanted to... Uh, uh, Dave Davis, after he read my pilot said you got to do a spec script so I looked at taxi and I said all right what's the story that I want to do and I had a, a couple of ideas the first thing you do is you look at the characters you want to write for you got to go right down the middle of the series all right so uh, in the case of taxi uh, you know it was all these losers uh, except for one who wanted to be a cab driver and I thought uh, I wanted to do a show about Louis mm -hmm. Danny DeVito and Mary Lou Henner what was the primary conflict between those two characters. Well, he was always hitting on her. The story I, idea I came up with is I said, well, what if, two very important words, what if Louie gets caught peeping at Elaine? She, she gets, gets him fire. fired. And that became the premise for my second one that I wrote, uh, which was uh, Louie goes too far and then he's got to beg for his job back after he gets fired convincing her that he understood what uh, was wrong with peeping at a woman without her permission, sexual harassment story. The second one I did was uh, one where, um, again, you start with character. Well, the hardest character to write a story for was the reasonable man character lead, Alex Rieger in Taxi. You know, he wanted to be a taxi driver, and I thought, well, I wanted to do a show about addiction in some way, so I thought, well, what if... Alex was a compulsive gambler. Somebody gives him the biggest tip of his life, dropping him off at Atlantic City, and he goes in and he goes off the wagon and he starts gambling. And then I thought, well, the story for most addicts is it takes another addict to save you. And the other favorite character that I had on that show, that I loved on that show, was Reverend Jim, who was a major drug yes. addict. And it's Reverend Jim saving Alex, the compulsive gambler, in a toilet when Alex is begging... Jim for his last dime. The story, the beginning, the middle, the end, for all, for both of these, uh, remained the same. Inciting incident which got him into trouble, peeping at a lane, or going off the wagon, a complication, which is he gets fired in the other episode, in the first episode, in the gambling episode, it's that he starts to uh, lose his money again, and then has to be saved in the end. Those things are, are, are the things you have to do in writing your story. So the process is once you get yourself that inciting incident, once you kind of figure out where you may be going in the end, you're rewriting towards that the whole time, including the stories that were actually told. I mean, I came up in my draft about these scripts with, um, you know, penultimate scenes and stories and how they would unfold, but by the time the rewrites were done and the last show was shot, those stories had been rewritten three, four, five times trying to find just the right one. You know, my, my current writing partner these days came in as a young writer. She, she, it was at the end of Who's the Boss where I was killing for stories. She came in and she gave me her what if, which was what if Angela and Tony, who in a previous episode had checked into a hotel under the same name and now the IRS says they're officially married, 
I went, oh my God, in the seventh year of a show, I'm killing for that story. That's a great story uh, for us to do. The most important part of the process is the what if. What's the story? What's that inciting incident? Or what's that last scene that you just want to go for? When we came up with uh, The Sweet Line, Jim Gagan and I were working on Silver Spoons. We were, uh, you know, well over 30 plus years ago. And we had just gotten rid of Jason Bateman, who went on to do his own series off that series. We had just gotten Alfonso Ribeiro, who had done the tap mm -hmm. dance kid in, on Broadway. And we said, this kid's a star. Let's see if we can come up with a show with him and get out from under these people who have got us working here at 2, 3 a.m. in the morning. What do we do? What's the what if? Well, the kid's talented, music would be good, blah, blah, blah. Uh, I had always said I wanted to do something like Eloise at the Plaza, but we couldn't get the rights to that. Jim went back east and had stayed in New York, uh, and he had just seen Bobby Short at the Carlisle. And he came back and he said, what if we did a show about a guy like Bobby Short, who has a kid, like Alfonso Ribeiro, and as part of their gig at the hotel they work at, they get a room. And that was the first Sweet Life. Um, we wrote it twice, sold it twice, but the third time was the charm when I went in and met to, with the Disney Channel. And now it were these twins that I was brought. So it starts with character. And I pitched them the Sweet Life, only mom is the singer with these two twins, and the line I used to sell it was, I said, uh, it's about two Bart Simpsons run amok at the Ritz. And in that premise, again, in that pitch, mm -hmm. everything was implied that had to be written. So when you talk about what's your process, well, if you got something that, that keys you into an active premise, and it starts with characters, two Bart Simpsons, run amok is your verb, at the Ritz, you know what you got. Once you've pitched it and they buy it, yes, you come out with your outline for... Right. After I did that, it was, okay, sold, go write it. For smart guy, like I said, it's always easier when someone brings you a project. So if you don't have one, you've got to give yourself your own assignment. So that one was already created? The shows that are already created, you're trying to sell them a spectrum. Oh, okay. Original shows, oh, okay. you're coming up with, with everything. With an idea. Okay. You need your character. You need your, you know, so... Uh, and then the situation, and then what the inherent conflict is week in and week out. So with Smart Guy, they brought me the kid. So I had a real kid. I, I, I asked Suzanne to pass, who was the, right. the person who brought the kid to me, uh, and she was brilliant. I mean, found the Jackson 5, my goodness. Mm -hmm. She knew talent. I said, tell me, in, in, you know, how would you describe Taj? You, knew him, you know him, because TV tends to be much more of a personality medium, you know, especially with kids you're not going to get. Mm -hmm. You know, the acting, where they assume a whole other persona and person, role. Uh, so uh, he said, she said, he's like a little man. He's really smart. So now I go home and I start thinking about, okay, he's a smart kid. And then you start, I started to, 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 to uh, free associate. Well, in my life, and again, you go back to sort of what you know. Even if it isn't exactly your right. life, you're looking for that. Because the truth about writing is if you write something good, it's going to be universal. And it's going to speak to anybody, even if they did not have that experience, it will somehow seem mm -hmm. real to them. I, I had a brilliant younger brother who, when he was, you know, eight years old, went scavenging for parts down the alley and built himself a laser and for a science project, demonstrated it in class and burnt the teacher's desk. <laughs> Smart guy. Right. I went to high school with a kid, Cammie Monash, who was this little genius kid, you know, in, in my calculus class, and he was 11 years old. So I thought, okay, smart guy, I'll do a smart guy show about a genius kid um, in a blue-collar family, basically. And the way I pitched it was, I went in and I said, uh, I, I, like I said, I'm very visual, so I pitched the opening scene. You know, a yellow bus pulls up in front of a high school, you go close to the, the door, it, it mm -hmm. swings open, and you see a high school kid get out, another tall high school kid get out, another tall high school kid. And then at the bottom of the frame, you just see the top of the kid's head. <laughs> and then behind him, another tall high school kid. And then as you widen out, a, a cute little cheerleader comes out and says, Did you get on the wrong bus, little boy? He goes, Nope, I go to school here. See you at the prom. And walks off. Now he goes in to his class. He sits down at a desk in front of a girl who's being hit on by this cute guy. And as he sits down at the desk, the guy leans over and he says, scram. He gives him a look and he walks away and the girl goes, well, 
why were you so mean to that cute little boy? And he goes, that's no cute little boy, that's my brother. <laughs> At that, which point Garth Anseer said, I like this show, it's a buy. You know, so what the process is, you need that what if. It can come from anywhere. I, I became friends with this guy, Matt Williams, who had created Home Improvement. Mm -hmm. And he wanted me to work on the show, but I wasn't able to. I was doing another one. I called him up and I said, Matt, I have an idea for a show for, for Tim and for Home Improvement. He said, what is it? I said, I'm just going to give you the title and you'll know what it is. He says, okay, what is it? And I said, to kill a woodpecker. And he said, thank you very much. <laughs> Hung up the phone. And a month later, they had a show on about the character going to war with a woodpecker that was driving him nuts, mm -hmm. which was the perfect Tim Allen right. show. It starts with his character. Mm. Man versus nature, man versus man. That was all home improvement was, but in a comedy. Right. You're bouncing off and free associating with whatever your challenge is mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. when you're writing. Mm -hmm. In creating a show like The Smart Guy, which you got the actor, you were told, you're gonna, you're, we're writing for this kid. Right. So then you came up with the, with the pitch. Do you do a Bible? like of stories for your first season? How, how does that work? Usually, you, you, know, you, you, you pitch them the show, they buy the premise, then they want to know, you know anywhere from five to 10 stories. They sometimes ask for Bibles. The big difference was that when you're doing episodic TV, which is what we used to do all the time, you didn't need a Bible per se. Because if you had a good show, you knew the good show was going to give you stories. Okay. It, it had legs. You could tell that it had legs. You still had to give them an idea of what the type of stories were. Uh, these days, they do serialized, which is the whole binge-watching right. thing. Where, you know, it's like we all lose our friends and family. Which families. was started by House of Cards. Thank you very much. Uh, back in 2008, 2000, 2008, I went to NAPTI. Ted Sarandos, who mm -hmm. is Netflix was giving a speech about what they were doing at Netflix, and they were just starting into originals. And as I sat there listening, he said, we just bought The Sweet Life of Zack and Cody. And I'm going, well, you can't get a better entree for me than this. So after his talk, I went up and I said, I'm Danny Kalis, co-creator of The Sweet Life of Zack and Cody. Would you be interested in buying another series from me? Because I'm down here trying to independently market my own shows. Mm -hmm. And he said... Well, the answer is no, because we're more interested in shows that people watch over and over again from beginning to end. We want them to come to Netflix and then watch it. They weren't even calling it binge watching yet. And I said, but why would you get The Sweet Life of Zack and Cody then? He said, because if it's an established show, what we've discovered is kids will watch it over and over and over and over and over and over and over again. And that works for our business model. So we wouldn't buy an original, but of course we'd buy one that was already right. established. So the way we view TV has changed so <laughs> radically. And now instead of doing 22 episodes in a season, we're looking at doing anywhere from 6 to 10 doesn't mean stories are any right. less important, right. but the model has so significantly changed in that way. Back then, before House of Cards, they were figuring out that streaming, well, it wasn't even streaming then, it was downloading, it was sending out... Right, the videos. The videos, that, that was a business model. I mean, in, in the mm -hmm. days when my uncle first started in TV, that golden age of television, you saw the episode once when it was on, and then summer reruns. I mean, that's it. Yeah. that was it. You having been a veteran in this business for so many years and knowing the ins and outs of writing back in the day to what it's evolved to today, that you have a business in which you can mentor young writers or help, help get them on the right track. There's so many people out there teaching classes on how to, you know, how to sell your show, how to pitch your show, how to, but they've never sold a show. They've never pitched a show. They've never written a show. And yet they've become the script doctors. And so what I appreciate is the fact that you've done it all. In addition to what you do, mm -hmm. your day job, which is running shows, 
you also have a business where you help young young writers or writers who got stuck, I would think. If I was writing and I got stuck, I would want to go to somebody to kind of help me get out of the ditch. I had great mentors, great teachers, and so paying back is very much a part of, uh, it's who I am now more than ever. I was given this great opportunity to go teach down at Chapman. I thought my career was pretty much over. <laughs> I was about 50 at the time. I had just shot this pilot for Sweet Life and didn't know if it was going to get a pickup uh, and had the best time of my life marshalling these 60 kids uh, down at Chapman to actually produce, shoot this pilot they had written in a previous class that a friend of mine had written. He said, you're the only writer, producer, who's also director that I know and you want to teach. And I said, I'll take the class. It was just fantastic, you know. And, and they, even, they, they even gave me a plaque. At the Friendship Hotel, uh, on this day, May 17, 2004, we present Professor Danny Kalis the first annual Kami Award for Best Professional in a Student Sitcom Production. <laughs> and they gave me the top ten Dannyisms. Ten. Comedy is precision. Nine. That is horrible. Off the student's <laughs> tears. But it's, it's pretty good. We can work with it. Hey, what about a RuPaul type? Can we get a RuPaul type? I really want a RuPaul type. Number seven, quiet. Wait, speak up. Number six, hold. Number five, did I ever tell you all about the time? Yeah, I did a lot of that. Oh, that's of hilarious. That. Four, you have 17 hours to restructure Act 2. Is that going to be a problem? <laughs> Three, I yell at you for everyone's benefit. <laughs> Two, hold. <laughs> uh, one, track the attitudes, people. So. Nice. Uh, when you're on a big sound stage and you got 100 people, you know, you're, it's, it's, it's an army. Teaching these kids was great and teaching them in a way where I said, I'm going to run this just the way I would run a show. No different. They loved it. At least a handful of them ended up working in the business. And after that, uh, once Sweet Life had its run, I went back and started teaching at UCLA. And now I'm developing a website uh, and a service in which uh, I can reach more uh, students who really do have something uh, to offer and are looking to produce uh, scripts, not simply uh, experiment. The best group I had coming through UCLA started with me in, in how to outline your spec script, the whole process, and actually deconstruct a script for a show already on the air and then construct And that's own. important before you start writing because you need to know what that process is. The best thing to do, I didn't have the, the classes, the schools, but I had a girlfriend at the time who was the secretary to Tony Thomopoulos who was running ABC. Mm -hmm. And he got all the scripts from all the sitcoms for ABC, but he wouldn't read them. So she would send me all the scripts. So all I did was read script after script after script after script. You start to absorb what it is. You begin to hear the rhythms. You begin to see how the, the, the story rises and falls and rises again. So when you talk about today, and you just got to write. You got to put it down on paper. Right, but what you've done is you've boiled down all the experience you have and say, okay, I'm going to give you a cheat sheet. This is what the spine of, uh, of the story is. We're going to start with the skeleton, and then we're going to add to it. At UCLA, you taught, um, your first class was on outlining the, the story. UCLA has a great setup. The first thing they do, and this is for half hour, hour, and I'm sure they have it for screenplay. In the half hour world, they start with a class on outlining your spec script. And in that, you start with the story that mm -hmm. you come up with. And you learn how to uh, develop a story and write the outline. From which, in the second class, you actually write the full script. And that's where you will learn how to write your dialogue, um, how to uh, you know attack a scene, where to come in, where to go out, and of course the rewrite, because you're always rewriting throughout that. The third class follows uh, a similar one, only now you're doing the pilot. You're, okay. you're writing an original premise for a pilot. You've learned how to write a script, Correct. so now we want to see what you can do As on an your original. Own. Okay. 
where before all the elements were there, the character, the uh, conflict, the tone, the, the, the who, what, where, why, and how of it is there, we still needed the story. Now you need everything when you do your own. And that's more difficult and requires something of a different skill set um, as well. And you do first the outline on that, then you do writing the script. Uh, and there was uh, one group in particular which ended up being a core group of eight students over the course of one year who stuck with me through the whole thing. And I would say there's at least, at least five, six of them that I would have put on staff as beginning writers on a show because they had learned how to write and they had proven um, their ability to deliver, and that's key. So from a point of view of, 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 of what, to, what do I tell writers about how to structure a story, uh, I remember the first speech writing um, coach I ever had when I was a, a freshman in high school. He said, the first thing is the whole hum part. Oh, what, what's the whole hum part? The whole hum part is, you better grab my attention or I'm walking out of here. Mm -hmm. Why should I listen? And that's your opening. That's your inciting incident. Why should I watch this show? You need a solid opening to draw you in. Mm -hmm. The best book I ever read that gave me a sense of, of how to do the act of premise uh, and to deliver on a beginning, middle, end was a book called The Art of Dramatic Writing. Yes. La Jose Agri wrote a terrific book. Yes. Starts with character, of course, all the time. But in it, he discusses uh, the Hegelian theory of the dialectic. It's thesis, antithesis, and synthesis, otherwise known as your beginning, middle, and end. There we go, back to the beginning, middle, and end. And in that thesis, you set up what the character's conflict or journey is. Now, mm -hmm. there are plenty of places online where you can go find the hero's journey, right? and you can get it broken down, not just into beginning, middle, and end, but you can have eight parts of the journey, and the rising conflict and tension, uh, all of the elements that help you fill out that story and um, give you your scenes. If you start with a premise, a thesis, something that is challenging to your lead character, and then you give them an obstacle, something that, that, that's going to make it more difficult to achieve, that want, that end. If you don't have a character that wants something, you've got nothing to listen to. I'm, I'm whole humming my way to the next channel. Once you've reached that, then you've got to get to that synthesis, that great last scene. Think about all the great last scenes that you've seen that um, may not have ever been there when you first started out, but somehow over the process of discovering your character, the mm -hmm. journey, and where that took you, you get this incredible last scene. That's your synthesis that brings it all together at the end. That rising conflict is, is, is everything. And the best way to learn it is take your favorite TV shows, take your favorite movies, and deconstruct them. And in deconstructing it, one of the things you want to look for is what's a real story beat. Most people don't know what a real story beat looks like. In one of my classes, this, this, uh, this woman was writing an Insecure. And I said, go deconstruct the pilot of Insecure. And so she came back in, I said, okay, tell me, the first scene, what was the first story beat? Well, she's in front of her computer, not a story beat. Uh, and she, it's her birthday. Okay, it's her birthday, not a story beat though. Uh, and behind her is her boyfriend asleep in bed. Okay, still not a story beat. And she's online and she gets a text from her ex-boyfriend who wants to see her. And she went, oh, that's the story beat, I said. Correct. Girl on her birthday gets a text from an ex-boyfriend ex while her current boyfriend is asleep in bed behind her. That's a story beat. Right. Everything else is not. It's important. It's going to be used in the play, mm -hmm. but it's not a story beat. Deconstruct episodes. Deconstruct movies. Really challenge yourself and say, what's the story beat? What's moving the story forward? And the minute you hit something that isn't moving your story forward, it's going to be on the cutting room floor. The lie is that those that can't do teach. So it's always great when you have people who do teach. When you mentor a young writer, do you hold that, that writer accountable to get so many pages done? 
um, within a week or a month or to bring you back a whole script? Is it just you're walking them through process in a general way or do you get specific with them? Do you give them notes on the script? Right, two different questions. The deadlines are the deadlines. You know, I, I, I used to call them drop dead dates. Uh, like I would say to my line producer, uh, when do I have to give you a decision on this? And he'd say, uh, Friday. I said, no, 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 no. I want to know my drop dead date next Tuesday. Okay, thank you. That means no matter what, if I don't have that decision, I'm screwed. Okay. Same for a writer. Now, I don't care if you write it the hour before. I don't care if you write it the day I gave you the assignment and you went home. All I care about is... The drop dead date. Is my drop dead okay. date. Does it come in? And when you're not working a show and when you're not on assignment, it's really hard to give yourself drop dead dates. That's, Unless you're getting a paycheck. Boy, that makes it easy. Okay. So you got to pretend, you got to fool yourself. So from the second, I think, was what sort of notes do I give? If I'm teaching a class, then part of the note is to, to, to provide also uh, a, a, a more of a, a lesson uh, as to how this relates to writing and the process and all. But if we're just working, I'm not teaching. Okay. We're just trying to solve a problem. I'm, okay. You, we're equal. What I would tell writers in a room is that uh, you can disagree with me once, you can disagree with me twice, you can disagree with me 13 times. But the minute I say this is the way we're going with the story, I expect you all to be rowing in the same direction at that point. But in the process, you know, I don't care where that joke comes from or where that story turn comes from, as long as it works, mm -hmm. it makes it better. So in giving notes, that's the, the approach I take, which is, okay, how do we make this better? Why isn't this working? Here's where I stub my toe uh, on your story, where I stop being interested. You lost me here. It's really that simple. When I give somebody a script to read, I don't necessarily, you know, what I'm really looking for is where, when did it stop working for you? Okay. When did I lose you? The Ten Commandments of, of writing, I kind of think boils down to thou shalt not bore. Keep us entertained. Engage We're, us. It's that as the filmmaker, it's that as the director you know the director's job is to keep it moving so that it flows the writing should flow the acting should flow when you got when you're clicking it's all value added everybody brings something to it and the next thing you know you, you got a hit so everybody go do a hit excellent i have one of my most favorite women she is such a kick ass writer producer, teacher, award-winning. Um, her, her plays have been produced all over the world. And when I say all over the world, I mean all over the world. Moscow, Chile, Puerto Rico, and it goes on and on and on. Because she's that bad. She's a bad ass. I just want to introduce you to one of my favorite people, Carmen Rivera. Hey, Carmen, how are you? Hi. I'm fine, how are you? How I'm are you? great. First of all, I, I just, I, I, I've been so excited to see all the stuff that you've been doing. Uh, how, how, how you've been just, you and Candido, uh, Candido Tirado is her husband, and they do some amazing work, uh, individually and together. So I want to first uh, talk to you about how you got started. You know, where, where did you grow up at? Great. Um, uh, I grew up in, in Manhattan, actually. I was uh, born in Mount Sinai. In oh! Tarlo. So, um, and then I grew up in the Dykeman Projects in Inwood Heights. Okay. Uh, but I just want to, before, I just want to thank you so much, Lydia, for this. I've been a fan of yours. I follow your show, oh. so I'm honored to be <laughs> well. on Common Sense Mamita. Like, thank you. So thank you. So, gracias, gracias. Um, uh, yes, I grew up in Inwood Heights, at Dykeman Projects, and it's interesting because it was back when the projects, like I can tell you when the drugs came in. Like I was there pre-drugs, and then the drugs came in, and then things changed. But I feel really blessed to have grown up there because it was completely integrated i did not know uh that people sort of hated each other 
not sort of, that really hate each other. And the projects, you had like all the older ladies sit in the benches and it was like African-American, Jewish, Italian, Irish, Puerto Rican, Dominican, and Cuban all mixed together. So um, I feel very blessed. That's what the Dykeman projects were like in the late 60s, so. <laughs> yes. And then, and then heroin came in and then uh, uh, PCP came in. Absolutely. Yes. And that's when you saw the needles in the stairwell and people urinating in the elevators. But um, I remember the pre, <laughs> I was, uh, I mean, I didn't, that stuff didn't start happening until I was like 12 or 13. So I have a lot of memories of, of um, the community and a communal feeling before that. When did you start um, getting into writing? I always loved reading and stories and going back to Inwood, uh, the library, um, we'd have free puppet shows in the summer and my mother used to take me and then she said I could get two books every week and my mother started reading to me. So by the time I started kindergarten, I knew how to read and write um, and I just always loved stories, always loved stories. And then without knowing it, I was, um, I think I was doing the job of a playwright without knowing it. My favorite show was Lost in Space. And I wanted to be on that ship with them so badly. <laughs> so that I made up this whole story. Oh my God, I was, I mean, I literally fantasized it every night. Uh, and Don and Judy, like, Don was like the second captain and Judy was the oldest, the oldest child. And I had this whole fantasy that they got married and had a little girl and the little girl was me. <laughs> So I had like a whole like notebook of her costumes and all the um, I, uh, all the um, maldades, like all the mischievous things she would get involved with, with Mr. Smith and, and the robot. And, yes. Will, uh, danger, and Will Robinson. Yes. Oh, my God. I remember. So I don't remember necessarily the instances, but I remember like we were stuck once on a flying asteroid or something and we were all holding on and um and I designed my costumes in pink and lavender and like I was so I think I was already doing the playwright's job without knowing it but I always loved reading and I always loved stories and um I loved uh going to the library and taking books out and then when school started I didn't mind English class and I didn't mind reading for in, you know for school so I think it started young, but the idea of to be a writer didn't come much later. Um, and it was in school. It was in college. I took a Spanish writing class, and it was expository writing. We could write whatever we, you know, we would get assignments, but we could sort of like riff on the assignments. And my teacher called me one day after class, and I thought I was in trouble. And he's like, you're a writer. It's but you have a voice already. It just depends what you want to do with it. And I had always loved it, but I never thought about it. It's, I don't know. It just didn't, I don't know. It's like you go to school, you're supposed to, you know, be a doctor or, or you know, get a proper education and not be an artist. So, so the writing actually started in, you started writing in Spanish first. Well, it's interesting because it was in that class that I started to, craft stories not plays but stories in Spanish but I always wrote in English it was this weird code switching because I don't think in Spanish so I have to translate everything what was your but, first but yeah. what was your first play that you wrote oh my goodness so the very first play that I wrote was a play about oh god about a husband and wife and they have a big fight and they kill each other <laughs> and they go into heaven that wasn't my first service my first proper play and um and they go into the afterlife and they're getting ready to reincarnate and there's there's she's scared and they find each other and then you know i was a very young writer so i named him lazaro and i named her nirvana <laughs> And it was sort of like uh, she wasn't going to reincarnate, but then he was, and then maybe she would help him 
be a better man in the next life. So at the end, they, they separate. But anyway, that was my first play. <laughs> and what was the first play you had produced? Uh, actually, Candido started a theater company. Candido Torado, my husband, started a theater company with another woman named Gloria Zelaya, a director. And um, the first play I ever had produced with them, uh, I'm just thinking now of the timing. It could have either been the Lazaro the Nirvana play or an early version of La Gringa. Oh, wow. So I wrote a play called The Universe because... Puerto Ricans, we all think, well, the mythology of Puerto, R of Puerto Rico and La Borinquena is that it's the navel of the, of the world. So um, uh, I called it the universe, and it was just a um, sort of two scenes, a young woman with her uncle, and she's trying to get a job in Puerto Rico, and they won't hire her because she's not Puerto Rican. Because she's a New Yorkican? Okay, right. Well, she's, they say she's not a Puerto Rican national. Oh, okay. Which actually did happen to me. And that I happened to, to me. It. Well, not get a job, but going to Puerto Rico and them telling me I wasn't Puerto Rican. I think that they yeah, yeah. they wait for you to come to the island so they can scold you. <laughs> right. And you don't speak Spanish, right? And you, so it's funny, like, after so many years, I was so nervous about my accent. And I'm just like, you know what? My accent is the accent of the diaspora. So there it goes. There's nothing I can do about that. Yes. And uh, we're going to go out to eat tonight. Tengo hambre. You know, like, it's like let's, let's get back to life, you know. But um, my first play, you know, I, I, I feel in a way that, I know it was the universe. The universe was produced first. And then, like, the second season I did Lazaro and Nirvana. I wanted to be more funky and <laughs> play with, you know, experimental theater. So. And where did you start getting uh, the craft of, of playwriting? It was um, in, in school, but then, um, so, so as an undergraduate, I actually studied economics and Latin American literature. So part of the Latin American literature major was to take the writing expository class in Spanish, the writing, the writing class in Spanish. Then I decided I should go back to school. So I went back, I went, got my master's. So I took some playwriting classes there and they weren't bad. They were, you know, I had a, I, I feel I learned. Mm -hmm. I learned, I, I learned what the world of playwriting was like. But I, th I met Gandido before I went to graduate school and we totally clicked as people, as friends. Like we were clicked as friends, but then we also clicked artistically and spiritually. And he introduced me to his mentor. So I didn't really study with his mentor as Candido was with his mentor seven years. Wow. I only had him maybe one summer, and I met him. And Candido and I started already started dating. So in a way, Candido was my mentor, and I learned this Latin American th this theory that uh, uh, the playwright, his name is Guillermo Gentile. So Candido worked with him, and then um, I kind of was brought on as like the kid like that was sort of like tagging along and it was great because the theories made sense to me and um and basically uh i don't know if gandhi though went through it was just like you know uh the irrational part of us is what lives and breathes in theater and we're always looking for the reason right we're always looking why is something happening why is the motivation but but the motivation doesn't have to be reasonable. <laughs> like if there are reason, you know, full of reasons. So that for me made sense. So I would say like, I kind of learned a conventional Western craft, a, you know, Aristotelian craft in school and Guillermo and Candido brought me beyond that, mm -hmm. beyond mm -hmm. that into, into um, irrational and, parallel universes and an absurd, you know, we would call it absurd theater avant-garde, but it was beyond uh, the Aristotelian. And they are, Gandhi is a structure fiend. Like he loves structure. So it's not like you throw it out, it's you add. Like it's always an and, it's never an or, right? Like we always lean to or in this kind of way. Well, if you support this, then you can't support that. No, it's an and. 
it's an and. So um, that's where I began learning my craft. What was the first play that you did <clears throat> that you felt was successful? I would say La Gringa <clears throat> and the universe. <clears throat> like going back to the one act that was that became La Gringa, um, that was the first time that I felt like, oh, maybe this is for me. I think I'm, I think I might be home. I think this is right. I think this feels right. Um, because when I was an undergrad in school and I started writing stories, I was writing short stories. I didn't think about theater. And then I went to a workshop at the Puerto Rican traveling theater. I'm, I'm sorry. I went to see a play at the Puerto Rican traveling theater and they said free play writing classes in the back in the program. And I'm like, that sounds great. Free play writing classes. Okay. So I started going, and then there was when I realized I was a playwright. Wow. So I spent like three years writing short stories, mm -hmm. um, influenced very much by the avant-garde Latin American writers, um, Borges, Jorge Luis Borges, and uh, Cortázar, and um, uh, Julio Cortázar, and Gabriel Garcia Marquez. Like It was sort of like, this, like in the 80s, those were the writers. Right. And then, um, and I... Mm -hmm. I I think that my writing was okay, but then when I found playwriting, I was like, oh no, this is it. And then I quit my, I was working for a comp, uh, co uh, an insurance company, I quit my job, I went back to school, I got my master's, that's when I met Candido. So it's sort of like, as soon as I quit my job, um, Candido invited me to join the company, so I was in the company while I was in graduate school. Oh, wow. So, um, so that year what well, I met him in 88 and I quit in 90 1990 so um so sorry to to to, to no 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 take a circle this is your story today. girl you get to tell it however you want <laughs> oh, thank you but it was interesting because um I have like this whole collection of stories at, I mean I had at that time and I was like I don't send them out I don't know what to do and I was always trying to find workshops but as soon as I found playwriting, like it's like what they say that when you find when you're ready, you find your mentor. When you're ready, you find your path. It was like the world just opened up. So then I got into school. I got a fellowship. I, I started uh, writing plays in school. But then I started writing plays with Candido and his company. And I wrote the universe at that time while I was in graduate school. And um, uh, I started to get readings and I started taking all different uh, workshops. So it just things started falling into place. What was the first play that you took to a festival? Um, so it, it was uh, with International Women's Theater Project, I think. And it was in the 90s. I think I was still in school. And I had written a play actually that we produced in our company called Plastic Flowers. And it was about a young woman who's mentally challenged in Puerto Rico. And she's mentally challenged because her mother was given drugs by um, uh, by a pharmaceutical company. Uh, one, of part of the one of the experiments. experiments on us. Yes. Yeah. So, so she's very guilty. So she's very detached with a young girl. And uh, they told her that she has to get sterilized. And she's like, because she just got her period. So she's 13, 13. So they're getting ready to make the decision. And somebody's picking them up to take them to the hospital to sterilize her. Uh, but she's, um, but she doesn't know. And she wants to have babies. And so it's a lot about fertility. You know, the place theme is fertility and sort of what happens in a colonized situation, but through this family. Wow. And what happens. So that was done. We produced it here, uh, uh, the company, um, Candido and Gloria, it was, it was actually called Shaman Repertory Theater. And, um, and we wanted theater to be healing. And uh, so we produced it here and then I submitted it to the International Women's Project and it got done in Buffalo, New York. So I took the train <laughs> all the way to Buffalo. It was great and they put me up in a house and it was really nice. And, and when was your first uh, play um, when was your first uh, play festival that you traveled outside of the country? It was um, 
to Colombia, actually. The play, I've had uh, plastic flowers actually done in Chile, in Moscow, in theater conferences. But I was in, it was like professors brought the play and they did readings there. And I wasn't able to go. But um, my first proper tour, like proper festival outside of the country was Colombia, which is the, the uh, international theater. They have a really big theater festival every two years. So we were part of it in 2002. So that was really exciting. Oh, that is exciting. When you start writing, um, your, when you start writing, because you not only write plays, but you also write other stuff. Um, what what is how how do you start? Do you have an idea? Do you do you have a theme? Do you have a character in mind? Is there like one way that you start, or does it does the uh, does the piece inform you? I think it's the latter. I think the piece informs me. I think um, it just depends if it's a commission, if it's an essay. Like I've been asked to write essays for different um, for presentations and conferences or in an online magazine. So, so they kind of like for the conferences, like they like they like they ask me just write whatever you want, but the theme is identity, and so they ask me because being New Yorican or, you know, what, what are we diaspora, we, you know, so we're bicultural, bicultural, multilingual, multiracial. So, um, if the theme, I get asked though, actually a lot to talk about identity. So that's one part of it for plays. Um, it just depends if it's a commission or not. Um, sometimes it's, um, sometimes it's, it's, a uh, an experience. I remember once being on the train, going to a workshop, actually at the Puerto Rican traveling theater. And I'm just sitting there and I kind of have a face that people talk to on the train. I wish I didn't have it, but sometimes, you know, <laughs> you're open, so, you're open, Carmen. You just look like everybody's sister. I, Let me tell you what happened. Yeah. <laughs> and a guy, this guy came up to me and he goes, yo, mommy, yeah, mommy, yeah, you're Puerto Rican, right? And then I'm like, um, okay, <laughs> I just surrender. This is fine. I'm on the train. This doesn't seem dangerous. And he goes, I could tell, even though you like skin, I could tell because we come in all different colors. I'm telling you, mama, you know that, right? And like, I thought, yes, absolutely. That's what makes us beautiful, you know? And then he's like, yo, I'm messed up. Like, mama, can you give me this money? So, so I gave him like a dollar and then he started crying. And he goes, my wife left me. She just left me and she took the kids and I don't know what the hell, you know, the F to do. And I'm just like, oh man, I'm like, I'm just sort of like, I don't, uh, I, I'm sorry, Papa. You know, I'm just trying to connect. And then uh, a man came in to sing doo -wop. Perhaps he was homeless. I mean, he looked like he was living it really rough. And the guy wakes up, like not wakes up, but he stands up and goes, oh man, I love doo -wop. <gasps> Oh my, and he starts singing with the homeless guy, which I perceive might have been homeless. And the, and you could tell the man was a little like scared and then but he's singing with him. And he's like, give money, give money to this guy. Come on, he could sing. And the guy could sing actually. Like he really, he was like, I'm thinking maybe he was a singer. Down on his luck. Goes, yeah, down, down on his, his luck. luck. Manager ran away with the money or something. I don't know. And and then and he goes oh my god you have such a beautiful voice and this was like during giuliani's time he's like i don't care what giuliani says you can get money like this and then i started to realize something's happening literally right in front of me and then um uh he collapsed oh he, he wants him to sing when we get married and he says i don't know and he goes i'll teach it to you and he starts trying to teach him and there's that and the guy's like yo man brother look i gotta go <laughs> and the guy collapses starts crying and the man that came in to sing sits on the floor and hugs him like a pieta and i was just like like I, I i i was stunned and i started crying and then i got i had to get off the train to go and the puerto rican traveling to um uh, puerto rican traveling theaters on 47th and i'm walking there and i'm crying and i don't know how to feel and i'm just sort of like well i don't know what i believe in but i think i just saw god like, mm. it felt like I saw God. Mm. So I get to the 
the, and, I, if, if, and I'm crying and I get to the workshop and I tell everybody what happened and everybody's like, oh my God, Carmen, they're so stinky. They're so this. Oh, I hate, them. not everybody, but like a lot of people were not like, oh, Carmen, like those, <laughs> you shouldn't get too close to those people. And I'm just like, but that was God. Yes. So that, I say that because I, I, I recently, that play I wrote in the 90s and I recently had it read about a year ago so it's it's and I realized like where it came from so it's been in my consciousness so from there I wrote a play I wrote a monologue and then it ended with the singer coming in and then in another instance this whole family of women are going to prison to visit their men and they're all dressed up and they're like take a picture of me and when it was disposable before yes. cell phones and I was like wow and then there was an older woman like maybe like the la abuela, like the grandmother and I'm like wow what like and this was i was actually going to a teaching artist job in bushwick and it was off the j train so then that like like that was another imprinting so then i combined the two stories and i wrote a play about this group of people that get stuck on a train wow so that came that was like in a way, the muse, right? The, the muse comes in all different ways. Other times it's a commission and then you, you do research and you start trying to connect to the character and find something that, an entry point in. Um, but the next, it's funny because it's called The Next Stop. And um, I just heard it read last, no, it was either, yeah, it was early 2019. And I was like, oh my God, I haven't heard this play in a long time. And it's like, that you know it has my heart that play because that uh, how humanity gets through its day i don't know yeah. <laughs> she is an award-winning tv writer best-selling author film television and live event producer director visual artist inspirational speaker stand-up comedian mother and grandmother and child of god please help me welcome t faye griffin so let's talk about just collaborating as a writer in general. Mm -hmm. A lot of times new writers are so eager to write that they give away their material or they start the process without knowing what to ask for. You know, how to protect themselves. Mm -hmm. Once you left In Living Color and were collaborating, what were a few things that you learned as a writer? The biggest lesson is that you must be in a partnership that is equitable in terms of is that other writer do, do we share enough things in common I'm not saying you need to have a clone of yourself because that kind of defeats the pur purpose of collaborating mm -hmm. you want someone that has maybe divergent ideas or whatever you know that's what keeps it edgy and creative and all of that but on a personal level there's got to be enough commonality in purpose. Why are you writing? Why do you care about this project? Um, your values, your mores, you know, what is, mm -hmm. you know, your integrity level, all of those things. So that when the hit stuff hits the fan, and it will hit the fan, there's a bond that will keep that partnership working. I was thrown together when, when Sonia and I decided to go in different directions um, and we disbanded our partnership. My a, I was at with APA at that time. They tr they s tried to package me with a guy that was so far away from anything that's like me and what I care about in terms of material. It was painful. We lasted two weeks, and then I was like, "That's a wrap. That is a wrap." Not that he wasn't funny or talented or anything, but he had this desperation about him. It was all about the money. He wanted to be famous. You know, all this stuff. I just want to feed my kids. I'm just trying to feed my kids. That's all I'm trying to go home. That's really all I'm trying to do. So when it comes to collaboration, the number one thing I would say is to make sure that that partnership is viable, that it's really viable. Number two, be open. Be open to ex exchange ideas and, and listen and mm -hmm. listen. You know, we... As storytellers, we see it in our heads. We right. know what we want it to look and sound like and all of that. But be open to some, the other person's opinion. They may they may call you, you know, show you something that you never even thought about. Mm -hmm. And that's the beauty of it. There's a controversy going on with Tyler Perry right now about him going on record saying that he writes all of his stuff. Which he does not. Which he does not. 
Yes. Yes, we do know that. Um, and he doesn't give credit to the writers. No. A lot of those writers that that he does use, or I've been told by writers that he has used, mm-hmm. uh, there's no opportunity for them, if they're non-union, to go union because they don't get a contract. Mm-hmm. They don't have anything to show for it, which is why I'm talking collaboration because that's a, a part of collaboration. Mm-hmm. If I come to work for you, are you giving me a contract? What am I getting out of the deal? Yeah. And I think it's important for writers to have that first. If the project does very well, um, the, and you have not put it down on paper what your percentage is or what your fee is going to be or what, mm-hmm. you know, down the line, will you get residuals? Will mm-hmm. you get a point? Will you get this? Will you get that? Right. If you have not done the paperwork first, you're... Can I, can I give you a ex- prime example that happened to me mm-hmm. of doing what we call a handshake deal? Yes. Don't ever do handshake Don't deals. Don't ever do a handshake deal. Okay, go ahead. Ever. <laughs> There's a high-profile comedian that I wrote for and with on and off for nigh on 15 years. And if you know me, you know who it is, Steve Martin. And I only had a contract with Steve like in the early years um, on certain projects. He came to me and he says, there's this thing I want to do, this concert film I want to do. Come on and write with me. I'll bring you down to Texas to the ranch. We'll write, da da da. Did it, did it on handshake. Never got a check. Continued to work with him on other projects that were related to BET uh, because I was working for and with BET, but it was so painful. And then one day I got called into a meeting with him and he's like, what's wrong with you? Can I talk to you? What's wrong with you? And I said, I never got paid for a, this project. And he turned to his manager at the time, it was Sean McDonald, and said, Shawnee Mac, t like, and I could tell he, he, he knew I hadn't got paid. Don't be trying to pretend like you don't know. He says to Shawnee Mac, to Rashawn, he says, pay her what's fair. Now this is a concert film that went on DVD, it had a limited re- release theatrically, it's on home you know, video, DVD, whatever. I know that thing made money. It's still making money. They wrote me a check for $2,000. That's what they thought was, was fair. fair. Had I went to the book, WGBA book, and said, well, at least the minimum. Give me, give me, you know, Writers Guild minimum. We'll work with that. I would have been happy even with that. But for $2,000, and this thing is still selling. So, boys and girls, take a lesson from Auntie T. Do not do handshake deals. Get it one paper and if at all possible do only guild signatory signatory shows and even if it's not guild find out what the guild is is online what the base is and ask for the base yeah base plus 10 that's right because you got to pay your reps yeah i would also say if it's your first project or your second project don't sweat it because this is where you learn stuff This is where you learn not to take it anymore. I Mm -hmm. think everybody's got to go through that one bad deal Mm -hmm. to say, I will never do this again. But after your first or second thing, Mm -hmm. shut it down. down. No more freebies. Make people pay you, you know, and and get it first. Make sure that it it is decided when you Mm -hmm. first book that job, this is what it is so that you know moving forward I agreed to do this for two hundred dollars so I'm gonna stay committed because I agreed to do it because your word it has to be your bond absolutely and then after that you go you know what I put in two months for two hundred dollars I can't ever do that again again and the more you know about what the what the going rate is the the least likely people are gonna um, jack you off of your projects. A lot of times, especially for people of color, since we don't get a lot of opportunities, we aren't given all those wonderful deals and stuff, and then we're trying to make stuff ourselves, Mm -hmm. we will undersell ourselves. Every time. We will undersell uh, 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 other people, Mm -hmm. and you have to start with something, look, if if someone says to me, I'm starting this project and all I can pay you is $10, I get to decide if I'm going to go for the $10 because mm-hmm. they've given it to me in the front. They've said, this is what it is. Mm-hmm. There's no confusing that. Right. But when you say, oh, I'll pay you, they don't tell you what it is. 
and you finish the project and then they come back and they give you two dollars and fifty cents mm -hmm. that's an insult because but you've set yourself up right for that. i know who you for are was, now what they say first time shame on you second time it's shame on me not gonna happen not gonna happen again. you know or someone who hires you and then says oh you know we decided not to pay you that was my line of demarcation. That is the day that Tifa Griffin grew up in this industry and said, oh, heck no, this will never happen again. And so a lot of times people will come to me and they want me to do something for them. And here is my standard thing. It is X amount of dollars and it is 35% non-refundable deposit up front, period, done. We're done. And if you can't do that, I can't help you. I won't do it without a non-refundable deposit. You're going to pay me one way or the other. If you, dump, if you dump out of the project, whatever, that's on you. But I got at least my 35%. Some people 50% if I know their, their history. You have to be willing to walk away from the table. Once you understand what you bring to it, you have to be, be, be uh, uh, brave enough, courageous enough, to walk away from it. There's a guy that does these these uh, podcasts um, called Purpose and Profitability. His yes. name is you know you know Robert mm -hmm. Fukui, mm -hmm. and Robert uh, is a strong advocate for pricing yourself. You know at mm -hmm. the value at your value, determining what your value is, and never undercutting that, and be willing to walk away. And when I started doing that, I found that I had more work more work of worth because I'm not just some hack. Right. They know what, they, when you hire me, you know what you're getting. I like to believe that I have a really good reputation in this business. I've only quit two jobs in my entire well, three, whatever. <laughs> but, but in a 30 year career, and I have never missed a deadline. You know, if you've given me a reasonable deadline or we've negotiated a reasonable deadline, I hit it every time. So I think I've established that when you hire me, when I come to the table, I'm bringing you a lot. I'm bringing you experience. I'm bringing you expertise. I'm bringing you skill. I'm bringing you integrity. And I'm going to leave you with some value. All I'm asking is that you value me financially. And if you cannot do it, there's a difference between cannot do it and won't do it. Mm -hmm. I don't deal with you if you just won't do it. And it's easy to, to you know, kind of figure out who those who those people are but there are some people that just can't you know i'm new it's my first film it's a short we don't have it i get it let me introduce you to, to a young hungry writer you. exactly who can help you because exactly. i can't exactly you not only write for television you've written some books you've written for comedians you have also written for award shows mm -hmm. I want to find out about that because that's that's another skill set unto its own it is it's, it, it's definitely become what I think I'm most known for in this in this incarnation of my career is kind of the queen of award shows I mean my, my dream is to write either on the Oscars in fact one of my early mentors and role models was Rita Cash and Rita Cash to my knowledge was the first uh, and up until the time Whoopi wrote the year she hosted was the only black female to ever write on the Oscars Wow Rita Cash and so I worked with uh, Rita on the Essence Awards the old was Essence that the Awards. first time you worked on an award show it was the first time I worked on an award show but I wasn't a writer one of the skills that I had acquired over the years was clip clearance and licensing oh okay yeah you girl oh. trust oh no so I, I can know. do so I can clear some clips now okay I don't do music clearance that's a whole other animal but if you need some clips for something you're doing and it needs to be licensed I got you, girl. Okay, this is good to know. Yeah, Because that's a hard job. That's a hard job. Yes, it it's is. It's a hard job. But I, I, I was mentored by Giselle uh, Sanchez Rochette, who taught me how to do it. And so she brought, she was the lead clip clearance and segment, segment producer on the Essence Award. She brought me in as her second. So I got to observe Rita right, and, and Kefra Burns, who was the other writer on the show, who's Susan Taylor's husband. Who's okay. A, incredible writer. Oh, Kefra's. They're both amazing. But they wrote with such power and dignity and they were very linear in how they wrote and um, very visual and there was something about their style of writing that fascinated me. And so I, I, what was my first show? I don't remember what my first award show, but I've done Black Girls Rock a couple of times. I've done the Trip Trumpet Awards three times. The Gracies. What are the Gracies? The Gracies Awards is an award show that honors the accomplishments of women in 
journalism. Oh, and, and the Trumpet Awards are the Trumpet Awards is a, a, another. It's kind of like the, it's almost like the Image Awards. It's by a black organization out of Atlanta, Mr. Nona Clayton, who actually marched with Dr. King, and they again acknowledge it acknowledge um, the achievements and accomplishments of African Americans or or people who have um, roots in, in civil rights or who are advocates for civil rights and human rights and that kind of thing. Really heady stuff for somebody mm-hmm. who writes jokes, but because I have a life and I have a diversified creative portfolio. But it, it definitely is a very specific type of writing. Do you know uh, when you get it who the presenters are going to be or you sketch something out and then when they come you tweak it it is that's another we talked about collaboration Mm -hmm. earlier that's definitely collaborative effort case in point let's lose yes let's use black girls rock usually by the time i would get to black girls rock they already know who's hosting they already kind of know who they want to present in certain areas I might come to the table with certain ideas. I mean, Black Girls Rock, I wasn't the only writer. I had the privilege of writing um, with Dream Hampton. Dream Hampton is the creator and executive producer of Surviving R. Kelly. She's a force. Okay. So I got a chance to write with Dream uh, on a couple of Black, Girl Rock, Black Girls Rock. But generally, it's, it's kind of an ongoing process, depending on what their production schedule is like, who's available, that kind of thing. What I always try to do and what I'm known for is writing in the voice of the person who's presented, presenting. So it's not some cookie cutter, Bland stop, stuff. stop, right. stop. I write to the voice. I write to their sensibility. I write to their sense of humor if necessary. Or sometimes I'll pull them totally out like Donnie Cochran I had an opportunity to write for Mr. Cochran on the Trumpet Awards he was presenting to Vernon Jordan so I had Mr. Cochran you think he's going to come out and be very stoic and whatever and he goes back in a time when the blackest thing in the co- in the conference room was the coffee got a huge laugh Vernon Jordan da, 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 and it got a huge laugh for him and I watched it was so great I watched his shoulders relax when he got that laugh so it's like being conscious of who you're working with and giving them something that's going to evoke more confidence in them you know and show them in their best life Tony Goldwyn told me my writing was exquisite oh how lovely we love Tony Goldwyn (laughs) we love Tony Goldwyn so you've done a few workshops like for Mm -hmm. the Writers Guild Mm -hmm. um, also Irma Bombeck's uh, Mm -hmm. humor Camp mm-hmm. writers that, conference, uh-huh. the conference. Mm-hmm. Were they the same workshop, or you did different workshops for each? I did one? different ones, different ones, because it's a different audience. Like okay. for Irma Bombeck, which is only every other year, I taught a class. And Irma Bombeck was a humor, uh, a humorist she's writer. A, yeah, she's she a, passed she's, away from uh, cancer. From, yeah, from right? cancer. Mm-hmm. She was the the what do you call it? The godmother of humor writers. I devised a workshop. Um, to help people who wanted to write inspirational humor. My first book, Morning Manor, which is a devotional, which is very inspirational, but it's also very funny. So I taught a workshop based on that. The workshop that I taught at the Writers Guild was a, entry, it was a survey of comedic genres. It was in conjunction with a film festival, I think the African American Film Festival. Okay. And so these were film students. And so I taught them what the different, we talked about the genres, we talked about the literary devices, different types of things that go into making something funny. Comedy writing is one of the hardest things to do as far as a writer goes. It's the hardest. Because you got to be funny. You can't just think you're funny, but not be funny. Mm -hmm. So when you write something that is, you know, it's, it's crafted for comedy but it's not quite there. How do you punch it up? What is your approach to it? To making a joke better? Yes. Well, the first thing you have to know that comedy is very subjective, and so what somebody, whoever's giving you the note, you know what, this isn't quite it, I don't really think this is funny, uh, I don't think the audience, our audience will get it, then you have to really go back and think about that audience and then try to come at it at a, you know, at a different, you know, what did I miss? You know, if, I, if I'm right doing a show for a church, and I, this is like a really base example, and the pastor comes and goes, well, you used profanity in it, 
you know, for a church. Well, obviously you go back and go, okay, we'll take the profanity and, and still make it funny. Does that make sense? Absolutely. You just have to really know, you know who the, audience, the audience is. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And if you can't make it as funny as you want it, do you outsource it? That, it's that possible. Joke. It's okay. possible. Because I, I know that sometimes writers will have another writer mm-hmm. um, uh, tweak the jokes, mm-hmm. you know, punch up the jokes. So mm-hmm. Absolutely. It's the collaboration when it comes to comedy. Again, as long as you have somebody who's kind of like-minded. One of my favorite pe- person people to um, bounce jokes off of is Lisa Holly. Lisa is so... she Her mind... And you just start riffing with each other and stuff just comes out of you and I are like that when we start kidding around stuff just comes that's one way of approaching a punch up is get with somebody and get some help being a a writing consultant Mm -hmm. what does what is that for me it looks very different I know of writing consultants that simply get people you know they give them this list of exercises they give them assignments you know you start with their outline, you do then they teach them the process. I'm a hand holder, which is why I don't do it a lot. Most people who come to me say, I, you know, I have a book, I've always wanted to write a book, you know. My first task is to say, to determine, are you really a writer or are you somebody who just wants to write the book? And that way I can deal with you differently. Someone who just wants to write the book, I'm going to have to hand hold them because they're not gonna wanna do the work that it takes to write a book. It's more than a notion. Someone who is a writer, then we can get into the meat of it, what you're working on. I don't have to ploy you and get you to be a writer. You are a writer. You live, you wake up. That's one of my first, if you think about writing more than once a day, more than likely you're a writer. You know what I mean? So it, it's, it's something that I do, again, it's part of my creative portfolio. I don't really like it, but it makes good money. So tell me why you don't like it. It's like raising children. I don't like kids. <laughs> I don't. <laughs> I have them, don't mean I like them. No, it's like, it's like raising children. It's like, it it's, takes a lot of care. It takes a lot of care. And I, I, I'm, I'm at that age now where I'm at the get off my lawn yeah. stage. I don't have a, a lot of... But if I come across somebody that I really believe in them, I'm going to do it. You know, like, otherwise, it's, so you're being more selective. I mean, if you do, it, it's selective. like I, I want to enjoy this person. If mm-hmm. I if I'm going to be in the trenches with yeah. them for a period of time, I want us to work. Case in point, T.J. Mercer. Do you know T.J.? No, I don't. T.J. Mercer, the media maverick, Maven. Um, she is not a writer. She'll be the first one to tell you I am not a writer, but she is a five time best selling author because I am her editor. Mm. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. And because I've hand, I've kind of taken her by her hand and baby stepped her through all of her books and as a, she just turns out these bestsellers as a result but it is painful what advice can you give a young person who or or an older person who wants to write and wants to write in hollywood i would say what are the first steps for them to start on that path right 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 the road inroads to hollywood have changed you know it used to be standard you know pilot season's coming up you know you write some specs you try to get representation or if you have representation you get your representation to get you some meetings and you take your spec and you try to get on whatever but the game has changed so much my my top three are number one be versatile back to that creative portfolio mm-hmm. don't pigeonhole yourself have a comedy spec have a dramatic spec you know um be willing to try different avenues. Also, have a thick skin because get used to rejection because it happens. How um, important are specs? I think you come to a certain part in your career, at least I have. My last spec was a Roseanne. But I in have, the beginning. In the beginning, in very the beginning. important. It's your calling card. It's your it's your it's your your example that you show that I can write, that I do understand what this process is and I can do it. It's your calling card. It's very important. And it has to be pristine. It has to be really well written, have other eyes on it. I mean, just even typos and grammar, especially if you're a writer of color. Don't give them any reason. Oh, well, you know, they can't even spell, you know, whatever. And so don't give them an excuse to turn you down, but make sure that your spec is pristine. Networking. 
get out there's lots of organizations organization of black screenwriters there's there's all these organizations and meetup groups that you can get in because it's all about this town is all about relationships it's not just about who you know but who knows you and i hate that part of it but it's the reality of what it is you know what i mean every job i've gotten in industry is because somebody knew who i was i haven't had an agent since 2000 uh management anything i have not apply for a job I have every job I've gotten since 2000 they have come to me do I work all the time no but that's my road that's the journey that I that I chose but because you made those relationships people know to come to you they know to come to me and then the last thing I'll say about that is to understand that your journey in this industry is not going to look like anyone else's so don't don't compare don't compare your work don't compare your journey because you'll stay frustrated and discouraged if you do. Today, we have the pleasure of introducing you to one of my favorite people in the world, Mr. Dennis Leone. He is an, a creator, an executive producer, and an avid golfer. That Let's not forget that. He is one of the best people in the business, great personality, and you're going to get to know him today. So without further ado, please help me welcome Dennis Leone. Hey, Dennis, how are you? Hi, Lydia. I'm well, how are you? Good, you look great. I, I've been so excited about doing this interview with you. First of all, I want to know, um, where is it that you hail from? I'm from Tucson, Arizona, and uh, I grew up there and lived there for the first 22 years of my life, and uh, then we left and we moved to Hawaii for a couple of years. Uh, but Tucson is my home, and I love Tucson. I love the food there. The Mexican food is, is the best in the world. And, uh, you know, I'd go back if it wasn't so damn hot. <laughs> um, it's about 110 there today or something. I don't know what it is. Wow. But, uh, yeah, Debbie and I are now here in the by the beach, and it's pretty nice. Oh, how fantastic. So, so um, you said you lived in Hawaii for a few years. What took you to Hawaii? Well, Debbie always wanted to be a travel. So she got an interview with Pan Am, which was the old airline. And uh, they didn't hire her, but they flew her to Hawaii for the interview. And then she... She liked Hawaii. We had been living together for a long time, and uh, she loved Hawaii. And I said, is it nice there? And she said, oh, it's beautiful. I said, okay, just stay there. And I was working in the old Tucson. I was a stud man. And I had um, calcium deposits on my hips. I was getting hurt. Uh, Ricky had dropped me on my head. My neck was hurting. My hips were hurting. And I said, just stay in Hawaii, and I'll come. And I was working as an actor in those days. And uh, so I had my headshots um, put in order and got new ones. And we moved to, I moved to Hawaii, took all our stuff. We got a little apartment. And um, that was really where my career really took off. Wow. So I got, I got, I got on Hawaii Five O, and that's. Okay, the original Hawaii Five O. The original Hawaii The original, okay. Yes. So let me back up for those people who, <laughs> for those people who don't know who is Debbie. Debbie's my wife. We've been together for uh, last May. It was the fiftieth anniversary of our first date. So now you you and Debbie were in Hawaii. You started uh, doing work on Hawaii Five O. Yes, I uh, I got hired as an extra. And then they asked me if I wanted to be a stand-in. And so I, I stand-in, and it's union in Hawaii. So I was making, you know, in two days, I was making almost what I made a week in Tucson, at old Tucson. Wow. And, uh, and we were always going in overtime because Jack Lord was never on time. He was always late. He always came out of his trailer about 10 o'clock. We had 6 o'clock calls. He would come out late, and then we would go late, and so I made a oodles of money. It was just, it was great. And then they asked me, 
Don Mark Nielsen, who was one of my dearest friends, he was the second AD, and he was overworked. So one day he came up to me, he goes, I'm working too hard. Here's a radio. You are now a production assistant. So they bumped me, and I became a PA with a radio, and I handled all the things. I worked as a second second, and when Don got sick, I became the first, uh, the second AD. And that's how I really became. And Don Martin always wanted me to be an AD, but I didn't. I became a writer instead. Wow. So did you start writing in Hawaii? I did. I wrote my first script. It's called Alejandro. It's a, it's a feature film. Actually, it's a two-hour pilot for a series. It's a Western series about a Mexican boy who rescues saves the life of Columbus Delano, who was the uh, the uh, Secretary of Interior under, under Ulysses S. Grant. And it's a historical fiction, but it's about a, a Mexican boy. Oh, wow. So it's, it's a pretty cool story. So what I don't you... show I don't show it to anybody because it's not very good. How amazing. So then you started writing. You came to Los Angeles and started writing? Yes, I had my first script and I gave it to uh, my first agent was a woman named Fran Francine Whitkin. I don't think she's still in the business. I don't think she's still alive. Um, and uh, we we tried to give it to everybody. We gave it to uh, Robert Reed. We gave it to well, he wanted to read it, and Paul Williams read it, and a bunch of people. And it just sort of launched me. And then I started writing a bunch of other shows like Lou Grant and mash and uh i wrote some pilots and different things different series that were on the air at the time and then some pilots that were at at, at columbia because debbie was working in columbia so i got all the pilots it was pretty cool and uh, and so then i just was writing all kinds of spec scripts and uh i wrote about 11 of them before i finally got the job wow wow yeah. So let's talk about writing. What what is um, what are three tips you could give young people out there that want to get into writing? Well, if you want to be a writer, you have to write. I see so many people who come to me and they say, "Hey, I have a script and I want to do the script and it's their passion project." And I get that. But you have to keep writing. You can't stop People think, think that they can get away with one or two projects or even three. I wrote a dozen before, you know, I just kept writing and writing and writing and writing. And also you can't be precious about your writing. You have to understand that um, there are people will buy things for certain reasons and it has nothing to do with your passion necessarily or your voice. Um, if you go work for somebody else, you have to have um, be able to emulate their voice for their series so that you can do their show, not your show, their show. So, so uh, I'm going to stop you for one second. So when you're talking about knowing their voice, you're talking about when you're writing spec scripts? Yes, yes, because that's the way I came up in series television. And um, that's the best way, I think, to break in to get into somebody else's show because nowadays everybody wants to do their passion project and write their own show and everybody thinks that you know if it's great they're going to make it and they can sometimes because there's a lot of outlets now but staying on the air is a different deal so you have to learn how to keep your show on the air how to keep going how to, you can't just write you know two shows and think wow well, here we are because, hey, I had to write 53 of them for Resurrection. And then when I did Los Americans, I had to write 11. Um, you have to just generate stories and stories. And, and like I said, don't be precious because writing is rewriting. You have to rewrite your things. Things don't, don't come out the best the first time around. Maybe they do sometimes, but don't be precious always listen to other people. I've One of the things I think 
I'm not the smartest guy in the world, but I'm smart enough to know that I don't know everything. And so when somebody that I respect and I know is smart and knows about story, like Debbie for one, um, she's always been my best editor. Um, and we fight like hell about this. <laughs> but she, because she does think, because she was a VP at the ABC, she thinks she knows everything. But um, um, she is really good. And you have to listen to people and take the best of what they got. Um, I had to learn that on Resurrection Boulevard because I have writers coming to me all the time with ideas. And it was hard for me to let go of my ideas and take their ideas. But like I say, I'm not the sharpest knife in the drawer, but I'm sharp enough to know that I know a good idea when I hear one and to put it in my script. Because I'm going to get the credit anyway. So, so let me... Yes. Resurrection Boulevard is mine. So, so, uh, um, so let me ask you about um, writing on other people's shows. So you, yeah. um, you would get on, let's say, Lou Grant, or you got on another TV show. What, what did you have to learn? Uh, you mentioned you have to learn uh, the people's voices. What else, as a, a young writer coming on to somebody else's sta uh, um, uh, uh, um, writer's room, what, what else do you have to learn? Uh, well, I mean, Gil Grant was really my mentor. I did three shows with Gil. And um, he taught me that 75% of being on the staff is being able to get along with everyone. And the other 25 is the talent. Because if you can't get along with people, they'll fire you. It's that simple. And you have to, um, so it's about emulating the voice of the showrunner. It's about being able to get along and work with other people. And, you know, because I had lots of bosses. I didn't come in, step in and be an EP. I stepped in and I was a freelance writer. I wrote my first script, Paul High, for NBC, um, and that was a Gil Grant show, and he hired me, but I was just a freelance. I wasn't even on the staff, and um, uh, like an arrogant little guy that I was, I gave some notes to one of the writers, and next thing you know, they're angry with me, because I mean, who am I to come in from the outside and start telling staff writers what to do. Can, do and you yet, remember those notes? Do you remember the notes you gave? I, I don't remember them. I know that I uh, proved to Gil that I could do this. When it, he took me into the editing room and we were looking at one of my episodes and I gave him a note and I can remember it, but it, it's a too long a story. And uh, he agreed with me. He said, absolutely, you're right. So he knew that I could get this. And um, actually going back to Hawaii Five-0, um, in the old days they used to have boards. They, don't, they didn't have computers. They had boards with little strips and each strip represented a scene. And they put a whole board together with all the strips. And um, uh, Scott Maitland, who was the first AD on Hawaii Five-0 one day said, Let's let Dennis try to get a shot at the board. So they let me take the board home for an episode. And I put the board in with day for night, night for day, all the scenes that belong together. You know, it was shot seven day episodes. And uh, I took it back and, and Scotty and Don Martin asked Scotty, he said, well, you know, Dennis did this board. What are we going to do? And Scott said, we're going to use it. He did a fantastic job. So I knew that I could do this, and that's where I got my confidence, and so I could be an AD. I could be, I learned that I could be anything that I wanted because then I started writing, because writing is where the control is, especially in series television, because in series television, writers are king, and directors are guests. They just come on as guests, like guest stars. And they do an episode, two episodes, seven episodes, who knows? Um, but they are at the mercy of the 
the showrunner because the show I cut I recut all the directors and some of them loved it maybe some of them didn't I mean I had my issues sometimes with Jesus I left Jesus Torino but you know sometimes I didn't agree with him you know and, and it was my show and I was going to do what I wanted to do so Dennis you were talking about spec scripts what exactly is a spec script a spec strip is a sample of your writing, whether it is part of um, uh, one of the shows that you want to write, or maybe it's a really good script of another hit show that's on the air that shows a sensibility that you can match the show that you want to write for. Like if it's a mystery, or it's a horror show, or it's a love uh, romantic comedy, or whatever it is. Um, uh, I wrote, like I said, Lou Grant, Nash, and, and uh, oh my, Roseanne. Uh, I wrote a bunch of scripts. I can't even remember all the scripts I've written. I think I sent you a thing of, and you've only got the ones that were, have been produced. Right. Not all the ones that are, are samples of other shows. I, I remember Linda Bloodworth who is an Emmy-nominated writer for M.A.S.H., um, she read my M.A.S.H., and she thought it was, you know, camera-ready. And she went on to do uh, Designing Women, right? That yes, was her she did Designing show. Women. Yes. She was she was wonderful. I loved her. She, she helped me so much. She was at the Columbia at the, in those days, and that's how I met her. And then I met Ike Jones, who gave me my first job, um, and uh, he was a producer there at, at Columbia with, with uh, Lonnie Elder. I don't know if you, you know Lonnie yes, Elder. Yes, I know Lonnie Elder, um, yes. But um, I met all these people, amazing people. And Ike introduced me to um, uh, uh, Ju It's a funny story. I'll, I'll tell you really quickly. Uh, he used to take me to the horse races. And we'd go to the horse races and... and he loved the horses. So one day I'm sitting in a box and I, and there's a guy next to us and he's bet on the horses and he's talking to me and I says, yeah, yeah, I want you to meet Julie. He, he's a, he's a writer too. Talk to him. So we're, I'm talking to this guy named Julie and he's a, he's a lovely older gentleman and he's telling me all these things about, yeah, you should write this and, and you know, do this and do that, do that. And I go, thank you very much. I appreciate it. You know, I'm just a beginning writer, and uh, I'm doing the best, you know, I, all these things. Anyway, later on, I'm talking to Ike, and Ike goes, you know who that is, right? And I go, no. And he goes, that's the guy who wrote Casablanca. Wow. I was talking to Julius Epstein. Wow. And he was giving me advice on how to be a writer. So, and then later on, he, he had me talk to Carl Foreman, who wrote the original High Noon and Guns of Navarone. And I mean, it's it's been a pretty amazing career. So what I'm, did, I'm very fortunate. What was one takeaway you got from uh, Julie? Well, he just encouraged me to keep writing and keep writing. Don't stop. You, that's a great thing about being a writer. You don't need anybody else. Directors, you need writers. Actors, you need writers. Everybody on the production team needs a writer, but writers only need themselves. So you can write and write and write and write to your heart's content. And that's what I did. You have done some wonderful plays about real live women that were really, um, if not feminist, a, a voice that Latinos know and embrace. Was was Julia de Burgos your first piece like that? Actually, before Julia de Burgos, I wrote about uh, a woman who was an AIDS advocate who created the, the AIDS marathon in Puerto Rico, and her name was Delia Rodriguez. She was the first real-life person I wrote about. Oh, Mentira, I'm sorry. No, no. I wrote... so. Julia de Burgos I wrote before La Lupe, but I wrote about two other women before that who were local heroes. And I wrote about a woman actually in 1990, one of my first plays, not the first, but one of my first, 
about a woman who is illiterate, who taught herself, who was able to be a functional literate and then decided like in her 50s to learn to read and write and then wow. teach other people and teach in workshops. And then... Um, now, was she someone you knew? What, was she someone you knew or you read? A workshop. I, actually, I was in graduate school and my friend was getting her doctorate and I was getting my master's and we were just tired. It was just one of those days like five papers are due in a week and you're just tired. And then she came up to her she goes, Nana, you shouldn't complain. At least you get to go to school. And we're like... <laughs> <laughs> like you know this school, and we were there to do a drama workshop with seniors and she was um at the time in her uh like 60s and then she told us a story that she was an illiterate and then she learned to read and write when she was in her 50s so she was 70 so she worked with seniors wow. helping them uh, with with medicaid application medicare or whatever they needed her to do like poetry workshops or something she worked at the center so I wrote about her, and then I interviewed her, and, and like, I was like, I'm sorry. She goes, Nella, it's okay. So I was like, oh, my God. So, um, and then I wrote about Delia Rodriguez, who's the AIDS at, uh, um, uh, ad, uh, activist, and she's amazing. She was just this amazing woman who just, like, nothing. I don't know. Uh, she uh there, there was this very famous pan am crash i think it was in puerto rico and half of the plane was on fire and the other half was submerged so people either burned or drowned she survived she was like wow. one of three people that survived wow <laughs> like and she was in the drowned like in the water part so she was able to get out i i it's just amazing so i wrote about her and then um i was commissioned to write about julia de burgos and then, uh, and then Lupe happened after. With La Lupe, what mm -hmm. was the impetus for you to write that play? I was commissioned, and then it was really hard to write. Um, writing about real people is hard, and there's something that I, whether it's my Achilles heel, heel or not, it's like, especially if it's... Well, no, it's anybody. It doesn't matter. But I, I don't want to disrespect women. I don't want to disrespect culture. And so many biopics look for, like, the gossip. And and I don't like to do that. So not that I'm, you know, I'd probably make more money if I did. Like, I don't know. But I just, so Lupe was hard. Lupe, it took a long time to find, find her voice. And then a friend of mine had a tape of her testimonial when she became a Christian. And then I played it, and then I heard her voice. And this was before YouTube. I was writing before YouTube. All this now is her testimonial, her Christian testimonial is now online, and and you can see it on YouTube. But she spoke really fast. She spoke really like, Oye, Lydia, 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 mira tu hija bien linda. Y tu, y tu hija quiere ser directora. I mean, you know, she spoke really, really fast and clear. She had beautiful fiction but really fast really fast and and she wouldn't call you Lydia she was Lydia Nicole Lydia Nicole venga aquí que tu quieres comer like she would be like Lydia Lydia Nicole right right Rivera. you know Candido, <laughs> Candido tirado, happy. you know like that's how she spoke about me so then I started to get her voice I started to and a lot of it is research is looking for research um uh actually what helped me and I didn't I'm thinking about this now I, for six summers, I worked at uh, City Lights Youth Theater, which no longer exists, and they had a program with the Lower East Side Tenement Museum where we wrote plays about immigrants that lived at 97 Orchard Street. And we would get like a dossier. Here's the history of the family, and the students, uh, the young people would learn about census and how you find information on people. And so we were, so I would help them craft plays. And, um, I'm sort of like, I'm not really, I'm like kind of writing it, but I'm not. I structure it and then I give everybody a scene and then they write the dialogue. So that helped a lot in terms of like taking facts and then dramatizing them and then bringing them to life. And um, because you just don't want to go see a biopic that's like scene one, this happened, scene two, this happened, scene three. You want to give, give it metaphor. So one year we did... Um, 
the women's suffrage movement and like what's happening now like there's always you know voting is always being marginalized because if you really leave it to the people <laughs> the people are going to vote for climate change and universal health care and education <laughs> like all social programs so so at that time they were trying to limit of course women's vote and then the immigrants vote so there was a huge coalition between immigrants and women so at the time there were all these ads taken out in paper and newspapers about what would happen if women voted like women would go crazy so we took all those ads and we made them interludes in between the scenes wow so there was one guy like so you remember like in the little rascals they had the women haters group so we created we found like this group that had like 10 label like the international uh, men against women who think that they're men kind of group. It was like this. So we created these buttons and then each like male character, like one of the, the young kids would come out and one, one kid was 10. So we made, they made this costume <laughs> oversized with the big button. Because, hi, I'm from the International Women's Movement. And then we always made them like take a breath after like, <sighs> so anyway, you can't let women vote. You can't let women, and then we would use the, we would use the, um, the uh the 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 advertisements so um so in any case um I, that trained me like that helped me so much so when lupe when julia de burgos and lupe came around i looked for metaphors about their life so that would be like that's like sort of my approach so julia in all of her poetry writes about the division with herself mm. she even has poetry to herself so i created two characters um the two Julias. And then for Lupe, um, I had heard uh, this in an interview. So when Lupe's career was over, she decided to go back to school and she went to Lehman College. And in Lehman College, she took a writing. She, she actually had her teaching certificate from Cuba, from Cuba. So she wanted to then be a teacher here. So she went back to school. And she took this writing class and she was supposed to write the difference. The, the lesson was like the, the difference between fiction and nonfiction. So for her nonfiction essay, she wrote about her life. So she gets the essay back and the teacher gave her an F. So imagine you get an F on your life. So she goes up to the teacher and she tells the teacher, why did you give me an F? And she goes, come on, really? You sang at Carnegie Hall? She goes, yes, I did. You sang with you, you sang, you had gold records and you lived in a mansion in Portland, New Jersey. Are you kidding? And she goes, that was my life. So then I was just like, that's gold for a play. Like, I was just like, oh, that's it. The play is the essay. Wow. So she's going to go back to, to want to change, to change, to change the grade. And then from there, she's, you know, we, we, that's the entry point into the story. So I like to look for this, you know, metaphors or, or something, some detail and it just depends on the research. It depends what you find and what's available and, and who you, you can speak to. And now we have the internet. I did research for both of those plays without the internet. I used to go to the library, old school, like Centro de uh, Puerto Rican Studies for Julia, for Lupe. I just try to find as many musicians did, I could. Did you do the same thing with Celia? Yeah, but Celia now the internet, we had the internet. Oh, okay. But it was a little easier and, there, and she wrote a biography. Okay. So it was a little easier. Uh, um, both Julia uh, and Lupe did not really. I mean, I think Lupe, the closest thing she has to a biography is her testimonial when she became a Christian. So, um, but Celia, there was a lot more information. So it was not that it was easier, it was still hard. But, um, like, how do we then tell the story in, in two hours? Right a lot of music of somebody who lived to, to a, you know, who lived into, you know, well into, to, into her 70s. Like, how do we tell that story? She was married to Pedro for 41 years. So we worked hard. It was sort of like, uh, what do we do? <laughs> yeah, but you so, were able to take uh, uh, Celia's story and La Lupe's story and really uh, make them three-dimensional and give us uh, a window into their lives, yeah. You know, which Thanks. which was fantastic, and and the music, you know, was like you were able to just put it all together and give it to us 
in a very uh, um, high end way. You know, it, it was like seeing a Broadway show. You know, well, it was there was not really like I, I wouldn't be able to distinguish. Oh, this is off Broadway and this is Broadway. It just was a oh. smaller theater because the writing was so good it, uh, uh, in both of those pieces, the writing and then you, then then the actors playing it. You know, it was so Great good. Cast. You oh know, God, La Lupe. Uh, I, well, I saw Suli Diaz do yes, it, Suli. and Suli se votó. <laughs> yes, she votó votá. Yes, <laughs> yes, yes. Like she, I mean, she left as we say pellejo. She left <laughs> like her soul on stage every night. She was she. The great story about the audition. She flew in for the audition. She she flew in from Miami dressed like La Lupe in shorts with the with the ponytail. Got a cab, went to the audition, got a cab, flew back home. Oh, wow! And we were like, yes, <laughs> like, and she can sing. I mean, she sang the role beautifully. Um, but yeah, no, I just want to say also like Celia Candido and I co-wrote, so it was like one of the first times we co-wrote together. Oh, okay. So it was interesting. Like we joked that we never fought while we were writing and then when the show was over we went back to work. Like, <laughs> like, usually they say like working together uh, it's and we did we had a lot of pressure but there was so much pressure there was no time like if we disagreed with something we had we literally would put like a timer on for five minutes okay you have five minutes to defend your point if not if it doesn't work we have to move on and you can't and we're like okay and we did it we stuck to it and we didn't fight it was interesting but finding that story was sort of we saw an interview with Celia um, speaking, speaking, and Pedro's there, and then she goes, Pedro, say something, you never say anything. Everybody thinks I don't let you speak. And then Candido and I looked at each other and we're like, <laughs> That's it. <laughs> ah, she's the narrator. And shortly thereafter, we saw a tribute to her. They did a beautiful tribute, to, that Mundo did a beautiful tribute to her before she died. And when she comes out, all in silver, by the way, like gorgeous, Pedro Knight is looking at her crying, and Gandido goes to me, that's where the play is. The play is in his mm. eyes. Mm. And I looked at Gandido, and I was like, that's right. All wow. right. So that's how that. And then it's like his perspective, and that helped us narrow too, because there was so much information. So it had to connect to their love story. If it didn't connect to their love story, it didn't make it into the play. I have the amazing, the prolific Rick Nahara and his lovely wife, Susie, and we are going to cover all kinds of lovely things. <laughs> When did you know you were an artist? I didn't fit in anything. I didn't fit in even with my own family. You know, Mexican. The joke was I was adopted because I didn't <laughs> fit with them. Like my grandfather was a cockfighter. You know, my grandmother was a union organizer. I came from really tough Chicanos. And I was very quiet. I never spoke. I was very shy. I was very withdrawn. And I was, I was flunked in kindergarten. They, they said, they, they felt that I was slow. They said, your child is slow. He is a slow child. My mom, of course, being Mexican, is like, Relieved well, they, they said he's slow. So we're going to hold him back for a while. Maybe he'll catch up. A teacher took me aside and she started talking to me. And she goes, he's very smart. He's really super intelligent. He's not slow. And so she said, let me, let me work with him. In class, she would uh, take me aside. She would simply go, tell me your story. And I, I wasn't being punished. I was like, oh, tell me your just Oh, I'll tell you stories. So I tell her stories, and she'd write them down, and she'd make a book out of it. My first story was called The Colored Boy. It was about a little boy that changed every color in the world, and no one knew how to be prejudiced against him because he was every color. And then he, he finds a boy that doesn't fit in in his world, and he realizes he's a colored boy too, and they're going to go back to their planet and he should, where color is celebrated, and everyone's color is beautiful. And that was my first book. I wrote, wrote writing it in kindergarten. It's not that I knew I was an artist. I knew I didn't fit, and I had to explain myself. And I think that's what an artist does. An artist explains the world around him and says, you're not seeing what I'm seeing. Let me explain this to you. Writing came before acting. Um, and then I, I, I forgot about writing altogether. I'd, 
I actually got a job with uh, Whoopi Goldberg in San Diego doing a Second City Improv special. And we both wrote. That's how they said you could stay longer if you wrote. And I was actually too young to be in scenes. I was 18 or 19. But it'd be a scene I'd write about going into a bar and we'd talk and all stuff. And the director would literally go, cut, Rick, you don't look like you can get in a bar. I mean, there's, you look like you're in high school. So I'd say, oh, well, I'll just, I'll write the scene then. So I'd come step out as a writer and I'd write it. And that's how they stayed longer. And then finally I went to Hollywood. This is all this is going on. My neighbor uh, told me, you're a really good writer. You should write. And Whoopi Goldberg, you should write. Everyone's telling me I should write. And my neighbor was John Wells, who created, you know, yes. uh, West Wing and all sorts of amazing things. And I finally said, you know, if all these people are telling me to write, I should write. What was the first thing that got you in acting? My father took me to a movie theater, and they were doing Cromwell. And it was red velour curtains, and they, they pulled back, and all of a sudden there's this Shakespearean-type film. And my father was a door-to-door -door salesman. And he leaned over and he said, you know, Rick, if you spoke beautifully like that, I'd be so proud of you. And that was it. Wow. And I was like, I want to make my dad proud. So I started reading Shakespeare. And I would recite it to him and I'd tell him, look what I read. How old were you? I was like 10 or something by that wow. point. And then finally, I memorized so much Shakespeare, I went to the Old Globe Theater at 17. They were doing auditions for people uh, for the Globe Education Tour. So you get to be in three shows and you tour around. And I had been in junior theater, but I memorized Shakespeare. So I walked in and they said, what do you want to do? I had a, my high school picture, literally, I stapled it to a piece of paper and wrote, junior theater, this play, <laughs> junior theater, this play. And they looked at me like a freak coming in there. And I did Romeo. I just, you know, but soft with like, you know, I'm doing that breaks and just pure. And they said, yeah, we'll hire you. You got the job. And I go, okay, but I need to get paid. And I was thinking about that. And I didn't negotiate were, a contract. You were negotiating I early nego on. I, okay. I even said, I, I need to be educated because I want to make sure I'm the best Shakespearean actor. So they didn't even have a program. So they started having actors teach me. This is way back when. These guys would go to the bars and they're, you know, just sit and talk about acting and stuff. And they'd sit down. Well, I was too young to get into a bar. So my lunchtime, I, I was on the Old Globe set stage. And I'd just do Shakespeare. I'd do things. I'd practice monologues and it was like a training ground and one day I'm out there and I hear this clapter clap and uh and I look up and there's you know at that time the guy who runs the old globe um was looking down and he goes you're a wonderful actor keep it up really good work and that was it so for me at that time was you know it's Craig Knoll and he was like the god of Shakespeare I trained for like a year and two and then I went to the working at the San Diego Rep and that ran for two years and from there it just I just kept working so let me ask you something. So you came to Hollywood. Did you uh, immediately uh, get into a Latino group or you were just trying to figure it no, out? No, Latinos hated me. <laughs> <laughs> they, they hated me. I, uh, Don't feel bad, Rick. They hated me <laughs> they too. Do. Well, you know, the, the reason I started Latins and Anonymous is funny enough, the people that were behind me were not Chicanos. Now, I have the Chicano, you know, the two cousins married to Cesar Chavez's daughters. My grandmother was a, um, you know, union worker. I come from the UFW people, all that stuff. I'm as Chicano as you could ever imagine. And a lot of people up here didn't accept me. Cause, you know, they'd say, they'd look at, I'm Huero. They'd go, look at him, look at him all Huero. I'm not talking Spanish too well. Look at him, you know. I bet he's Cuban. They actually accused me of being Cuban. <laughs> <laughs> it's Cuban, I know it. And so I do, and like I'm doing Latin's Anonymous. I'm like producing shows. Like, oh, look at him. He's producing his show. He's writing his show. He's directing. He's Cuban. And go, he works too hard. He works too hard. <laughs> and so it was weird. So I, I wasn't really accepted by a lot of, you know, hardcore Chicano types. And there was sm a small group. And I thought... This is what truly is indicative and wrong about our, our way we treat each other. You know, the Chicano crab syndrome they always talk about. But the people that were there for me were Cubans, Puerto Ricans, and everything else, because they were outsiders as well. Right. And I did a sketch about it, it was uh, in Latin's Anonymous, about Cuban actors and Chicano actors fighting for a role in West Side Story. <laughs> That's all it is. And they're both, you know, attacking each other. And that just comes from a feeling of, of lack. You know, there's no jobs, and here's this Cuban guy taking the job from me, and I'm a Chicano, and all this other stuff. And the reality is, a writer gives himself a job, because it's just, it's just fill it up. Just like you putting this show together, you gave yourself a job. Uh, you sat there and said, I'm going to make this, and it happens. And that's what an artist does normally. So for me, I started writing out of necessity, because I didn't like the roles. I, I couldn't play the roles. I, I played Cuban drug lords. I played all sorts of stuff. And eventually, I got tired of it. I, I was like, um, and I was making a living. It was, it was weird. But I said, um, these roles aren't for me. I was in Red Surf with George Clooney, and I remember thinking, I'm a Cuban. They said, you're a Cuban drug lord. And I go, what does that mean? 
Oh, well, Cuban drug lord is the biggest drug lord around. These guys <laughs> said, why? Because he salsas? I mean, I mean what's, what's it? And then Didn't I just, you see Scarface? I, you see Scarface? <laughs> <laughs> we just shot in America, California. And I'm like, well, yeah, all right, I'm a Cuban drug lord in Compton for some odd reason, working with surfers with George Clooney. And it all just seemed stupid and ridiculous. And I said, I can write this. And that was it. And finally I started, I started writing because I just couldn't play the roles. Latin's Anonymous was a big part of that. And then I did a one-man show at the Goodman called Pain of the Macho, and then Latino Logs, which eventually went to Broadway. Latino Logs is, if anything, was never about showcasing me. It was actually showcasing others. Because as an actor, they just assumed I could act. As a writer, they, it's weird. It's like the, every reviewer would talk about how great the writing is in Latino Logs. And then they'd say, oh, but Rick Nair is very good. And so that's the other thing, is you get used to going, when you're the writer, they're only thinking of the writing. If you're the act, but when you're both, so I'm gonna I'm gonna come back to uh, Latin's Anonymous because we're talking collaboration. Yeah, and I think that's something we don't discuss a lot. Yeah, Latin's Anonymous came from almost two two schools. One was the Teatro Capesino school, which was Diane and those groups, and they were more like we're an ensemble company. We have no identity. We just create this thing. But I came from the school of a writer writes and the writer's names on it and an actor can act, and you can write and act, and you can do a thousand things, but each one should get you know, your your share of the praise or condemnation. Your credit, yes. Either way, mm -hmm. credit. And so when we started doing Lads and Arms, they actually, the actors in it said, we're not writers, you're a writer, Rick. And if we, your name's gonna be first, it's gonna be Rick Nahara. And they didn't feel that was fair, and I said, well, you should be all our names. You, you write this sketch, and you put your name there, and Armando, you're going to write this sketch. You put your name there. It was more that division, and that really freaked them out. And then they got a lot of trouble because we were called Latins Anonymous. And a lot of people, some people, Chicanos would be like, you know, why is it Chicanos Anonymous? Culture Class is Chicano. And they do this stuff, and I go, wait a minute. Only one member of Culture Class is actually Chicano. Two are not Chicano. And I, with us, we are three groups. One's Col Colombian, one's Guatemalan, and one's um, Mexican, and the other was Mexican. So we are actually the... what. The, pretty much the demographic of Latino is. And I said, we can't call it anything but Latins Anonymous. And that time, as weird as it sounds, people did not like the learn, term Latino. Right. Everything had to be Chicano. And I said, not everyone agrees with everything in the Chicano movement, and not everyone um, wants to be called Chicano. Like, that was a big discussion among ourselves. And I thought, if we're arguing over what we should be called, how powerful are we? I mean, it doesn't matter, you know, because you could call any majority group, whatever we want to call them, we're not calling you Russian anymore. We're calling you Soviets. Yeah, okay. But when you're fighting over your name and title and identity, that's where the comedy lies. From that experience, what did you learn about collaboration that you have been able to take forward? Because as a writer, you've been in a lot of writer rooms. Yeah. You And, and a lot of times you probably have been, um, I don't want to speak for you, but you probably have been the only Latino in the room. Definitely. Definitely. And so... Yeah. What do you take with you into those rooms because that's supposed to be collaboration? You know, I understand women a lot more from being a Latino in Hollywood. It really sounds weird to say because with women, when they're very direct, they'll they'll look at them and, oh, she's a B. She's a B word. When a man's direct, he's very assertive. He's really in control. And I noticed that even with these, these presidential elections where now women are, are, are running and coming out, they, the picky you and things they grab women with, like, oh, she is mean to her her staff. She was not nice. It's like, women don't ever say that to a man. So you actually tend to look at women and go, that's my ally. I understand what she's going. And like a lot of women on, on writing staffs, the same way. You can't be so direct. So a lot of times as a Latino, I would have to be not as direct as I'd want to be. Like one time I was writing a pilot for, it was at HBO, and this is a big uh, writer. Turns to me and, and the starts of the scene is this woman's running from love. And so there's a conguero in Central Park playing a conga. He's like, hey, don't run from love, baby. Don't run from love. He's yelling out. The writer turns to me and goes, oh, my God, Rick. You can't write that. I'm like, what do you mean? A Puerto Rican man yelling at a white woman running through the park? You know how terrifying that is for her? You know how natural that is? <laughs> how many times a day that happens? <laughs> and, I, I was, and, and, I, and I'm shocked. And I'm like, what, what are you talking about? I go, he's like a big conguero man. He's not picking up this large conguero running after her. I go, there's no threat involved at all. And it's the theme of the show that she is running away from love. So he's like, wow, you're really, you're really right, Rick. You're actually right. And I did, you know, calmly tell him this, but I said, so-and-so, have you ever worked with a Latino before? Because he said, you know, Rick, you're such a great professional. And I go, have you ever worked with another Latino professional before? On cue, the maid walks in, 
with a cup of coffee and he goes, oh, Maria. That was it. That was his other professional he'd ever worked with. So being the, the, the lone Latin in the room, you can't be as direct, unfortunately. Later on, it, like I was writing on East Los High, great room, all Latinos. There was a shorthand. We didn't have to sit there and go, well, this happens for this. I didn't have to explain to people. And a lot of times, when you're the only Latino, you're explaining. If you're the only woman on staff, you're explaining what a woman goes through. It's about learning compassion. It's like I told someone, they were bringing up a woman. We don't talk about Latino explaining. Yeah, no, yeah, Latino explaining. <laughs> Latino I'm learning from Latino explaining to you. Uh, no, you, you uh, like, one of the greatest uh, writing experience for me was working on East Los High. I'm going to tell you, a lot of shows I worked on, you know, were tough. Tough. Like, in, when I first started, I was in Living Color. That was one of the toughest shows you'll ever write. But when I got to East Los High after so many years, it was great because there was, you know, Cuban was running the show, you know, Carlos uh, Portugal, and uh, a lot of people I knew were on the show. And it's mostly female staff. I think I was the only straight man on the staff, you know, which is weird. And, but it's also great. And Carlos would look and go, well, what would a straight guy say? <laughs> and so I'd, I would joke with him and go, no straight guy would ever talk to a woman like that. <laughs> so, <laughs> so between all of us, we kind of, you know, developed a shorthand and out of a lot of, you know, love and respect for everybody because everyone on that staff was very talented and good people. I think the love showed in the show. You know, it's funny enough, the show is full of drama. Cutting and... The show we would really write off camera was hilarious because we, we'd Kate's come up with these really funny off-color, horrible jokes you'd ever say. Then you'd go, okay, now back to the show. We go back to the show because it, it was just, it was a very sincere show. It was a shorthand that I'd never experienced before. I remember doing everything from Dr. Quinn to whatever show. You're constantly explaining. You're going, going whoa, 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 wait a minute. Colorado was part of Mexico or, or well, California, you know, the history we have is so fresh. And a lot of people, you know, don't realize our own history. That's, that's why, even talking about this, and I, I know you're bringing up Latins Anonymous, which was years ago. When you think of it, Louis Lachin came out of Latins Anonymous, who's done a lot of great TV work, who told One me One of that, the first Latina showrunners. Yeah, who at that time in Latins Anonymous told me she couldn't write. And I was like, I know you can't. You're going to write. We're all going to write. It was like a, a little guerrilla army. We had no choice. He was like, you're going to write the show. In fact, when we did the show at that time, our budget was like 1200 bucks to do like one night at LATC a weekend. And if we didn't make money, we'd have to close that weekend. And we'd all just put our own money together. This is I remember. Oh, yeah. We were, you know, it, everyone was broke that time. People were broke. Uh, and we didn't know it because everyone else around us was broke. <laughs> so it just seemed that's how people lived. What Latins Anonymous <laughs> did was to create this energy and yeah. make people excited. I mean, I, I just remember how exciting it was during that time. Yeah. You know, and then Culture Clash coming in to LATC with, when mm -hmm. Latins Anonymous was there. It was exciting because we were actually doing, you you, yeah. you saw people doing stuff. We weren't um, waiting for Godot. No, you know? no. <laughs> well, that's the thing. When you start to write for yourself, you, it gives you immediate power. I was at the Goodman Theater in Chicago. It was John Leguizamo, me, and Spalding Gray doing one person shows wow. that season and that's energy you go oh i gotta be john Leguizamo, spalding gray i better be. it kind of honed me as an actor because i said oh john's really quick and all this other stuff spalding's much more slow and i figured out i go i'll be in between <laughs> i'll have moments of that but on the whole i'm going to be a storyteller so the jokes i would tell would be more storytelling jokes and the reviews came out praising each one of our styles. And so I also learned that everyone can have a different style. You know, New York actors, and I played in New York being on Broadway, you had to have a different style to, to survive in New York. Because the audience will talk to you. I was yes. On Broadway, they will talk to you. And I remember doing a joke about Dominicans. It was a little on the uh, edgy side. I won't say it. But, but they all started laughing. And they, because they knew if I could joke back at them and throw it back, then it was okay for them to throw it at me. And then all of a sudden it became this energy. And it was actually the same energy in the, in the West Coast because, you know, the plays that people were doing for Latinos were actually pretty much like a white guy wants to write a play about a Latino. Oh, let's do this about Latinos. And, I, you know, they would tell me stories and, and I would just go, God, you, you're looking at Latinos. Uh, like one guy turns and goes, Latinos are so affectionate. If you do something for them, they'll give you a kiss on the cheek. And they're so, I'm like, it's not a dog you're talking about. It's like the St. Bernard's are so affectionate. They'll just run up and I'm like going, you don't know. These are people, you know, we are people and we're as complex and we're 
are not always perfect and we're we're humans that's what we are so what lads anonymous culture clash and chicano secret service was actually doing is saying we're not waiting for a south coast rep to hire us we're not waiting for a San Diego rep to give us the one Latino play in their season. We're going to create our own. That's what did it. Not only is he a writer, but he's a director. He's a producer. He's also known in the business as a showrunner. Please help me welcome the incredible, wonderful, talented, exceptional writer, Danny Kalis. So your first job in Hollywood was what? The first script I ever sold was uh, to the love boat. And how did you get that job? My father was standing in a bank line and uh, he knew this guy in front of him. They started talking. It turned out he was a producer of The Love Boat. He says, my, my son's writing. He's got this, uh, this uh, taxi script he wrote as a spec. So he read it and he called up and he said, yeah, have him come in and pitch to my story editors. They were uh, two guys. They were great guys. Uh, and I pitched 20 different story ideas to them. They finally bought the 21st one when I was driving <laughs> home. I came up with an act break, and uh, they said, have we ever done that one? I don't think we've ever done it. Yeah, we might be able to make a story out of that act break. Oh, my goodness. And how did you go from Love Boat to Taxi? What happened was I, I had been uh, working at a place called the Great American Food and Beverage Company. In Santa On Monica. Santa Monica. Yeah, yeah. yeah, I, was yeah. A, I was a singing bartender. Oh, wow. Yeah. And I wrote about the place. Uh, it was the very first uh, original I ever wrote. Uh, and it was a sitcom. And at the time, my favorite show was Taxi. So it seemed ripe. It was about a bunch of people who were not really waiters and bartenders mm -hmm. like Taxi, but they would all come out to, uh, to make it big, and none of them had. So I wrote it. And then, again, my dad, you're going to see a pattern here, uh, knew this guy, uh, Dave Davis, who um, was one of the uh, producers of Taxi and uh, creators of the show. I sent him my great American pilot, and he liked it. And we just started talking on the phone. He says, you got to write a spec script for a show on the air. Since Taxi was my favorite show, and the show... I, anyway, I took an idea for my show, and I wrote it for Taxi, and he really liked it. And he had retired from Taxi the year before, so we sent it up the line mm -hmm. to a producer he had left behind. And I got a call from Ed Weinberger, who was running the show with, with Jim Brooks at the time. And he said, we have a show like this, but good job. So then I went and I wrote another spec one and submitted that one. And that one they bought. Wow. And how old were you then? Oh, God. That far back. Yes. Huh? Uh, I Give was... Me dates. Oh, my God. <laughs> I want to say I was 27. Oh, wow. Excellent. When I sold that. Excellent. Yeah. So then you got to work on Taxi for a while. Well, I was a freelancer. Okay. So I wrote the, the second one I wrote, they bought. And then based on that, I became a hot young writer. Oh, okay. Because I like to say I started my career at the top. The top? <laughs> right. And it's been downhill ever since. <laughs> Not true, but okay. It still is just one of the best shows ever. You know, it got me an agent. It got me um, interviewed over at Norman Lear's company, Wow. Uh, Tandem. They had two new shows, Square Pegs, and Beats had written. She was off mm -hmm. at Saturday Night Live. Right. And then they had another show called Silver Spoons. My friend uh, Leonard Lightfoot was on it. Oh, I, I love Leonard yeah. Lightfoot. Oh. <laughs> we worked on uh, the Jeffersons together. He went from the Jeffersons to Silver Spoons. Of course. Yeah, of course. he played the police officer. Yeah. I was the gang leader. That he tried to arrest, yeah. Oh, perfect. <laughs> oh, I'd, I'd cast both of you in a heartbeat. Yeah. Oh, Leonard was great. He, yeah. He came in and saved us. He, we needed a, a... Well, so you know Silver Spoons, which is the show I worked on for five years. I did every episode except for the pilot. Earned my supervising producer stripes. So now tell us, what is a supervising producer? We're all writers. Okay. It's all writers. In television, writers are king, not in movies. Right. But in TV, we're kings. And the reason is because in a movie, when you write a script and the script's done, they can take the writer behind the woodshed and beat him into an inch of his life. <laughs> and if they need something, you know, they'll get another writer to punch right, it up, but right. it's done. Right. They don't need you anymore after no, you've written it. No, done. Right. But in TV, 
at least it used to be, we had 22 episodes a year, sometimes more, which meant, oh my God, we need another script. We shouldn't have killed that writer. TV is where, for writers, at least for me, you know, I got to see my work every week, and it was great. Unlike a film where the director is king. Yes. The writer is king, and the director normally is a freelancer. Some, yeah, unless, the they're, unless they happen to have uh, been a part of creating the show, the way Jim Burroughs was a part of Cheers, for mm -hmm. example. Yeah, they are mostly for hire. Okay. Usually, again, back earlier in the sitcom era, we had house directors, mostly one director that worked the show, so they were pretty well ensconced. Yeah, that was, uh, that's where TV needed, you need a script every week. And that's why uh, writers would move up the ladder. So you start as a freelancer. Uh, then after you freelance, you might get put on staff and you'd be called. When I first got on staff, they didn't even have a title. We didn't even get credit. The Guild finally fought for it and we got something called Program Consultant. So once we got that, then the next thing is you would be bumped up to, to a story editor. Now that's called an Article 14 writer. Okay. What that means is you're not just a writer, but you're working in a capacity above being a writer. You're editing other people's work. You're pitching stories. You're doing more. Then you get to being a producer. Same thing, Article 14 writer. So you're still functioning as a writer, but you're doing all these other producing functions. And is that different from the showrunner? All it is is now <laughs> after the producer, you then get bumped to something they call supervising producer. Okay because they needed an additional title <laughs> before you could become an executive producer. Oh, okay. Who is the showrunner? Who is usually the showrunner. Okay. So you got on Silver Spoons, you were king there for five years. No, I was never the king. Oh, you were never the king. Never the king <laughs> there. No, 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 never. Were you never. the prince? I wasn't even a prince. Oh, okay. I was, I was an earl. Okay. You okay. Know. <laughs> uh, now, I moved my way up to supervising producer, worked for some really great people and then a couple of not so great, uh, which you have to go through in this business. Became eventually, you know, the number two person on Silver Spoons. After that, I was still employed at, at Tandem and they'd have me on other shows. I did a show called The Charmings, which was a delight. Yes, I remember that and, on ABC. Oh, it was terrific. Rob and Prue, Rob uh, Stern and Prude and Frazier, they were the creators, exec producers of that show and uh, we had a grand time. From there, uh, when that show folded, I was sent over to work on Who's the Boss. Oh, okay. And it was on Who's the Boss over the course of four years that I went from just being a producer to being an executive producer, and Who's the Boss was the first show I ever ran. Wow. And then from there you went to uh, Smart Guy, or did you no, do after, after, Hanging uh, with Mr. Cooper? Yeah, after Who's the Boss, I ended up going over to do ha Hanging with Mr. Cooper, mm -hmm. which I ended up... With Mark Curry. With is Mark the Curry, lead, yeah. yeah. And I did that for show for a year. Then after that, I went back to um, work with Jim Brooks on a show called Phenom which lasted about a year. And uh, it was a great show, just didn't make it past that year. Uh, and it was a chance to go back and work with Jim after working with him on, on Taxi. He was the big guy at that time. Yes, he, he, he what, was. What was something that you learned from him as a writer, as a, maybe as a producer? What, what, what did you take away that you still use today? From basically all the people who, who were formative. Um, my uncle, Stan Kalis, who was one of the great producers of television uh, through the golden age of TV, from the Dick Powell anthology series to uh, Mission Impossible, Hawaii Five-0, Police Story, the whole, I mean, what I learned from him and the writers that would work with him is, uh, and from Dave Davis, and then from Jim Brooks, uh, they all had one version of the thing that, that Dave and Jim both said to me, uh, which is, uh, you know, stories are hard, scripts are easy, and that is in no way to denigrate the significance of writing the actual teleplay or screenplay. In fact, once you've got your story, then the hardest thing to do is the screenplay and the teleplay. But it's about story. You've got a good story, um, it's everything. What makes a good story? Uh, well, let's start with there should be a beginning, middle, and end. <laughs> you know, Why? no matter how short, no Why? matter how long. Why? Because it needs to move you, and if it doesn't move you, then what's the point? Okay. And, you know, it's action. It's active. You know, you need an active premise in a story. 
you know, we were talking about uh, West Side Story and Romeo and Juliet, you know. Arguably, uh, the, the, the active premise there is true love conquers all, even in death. Mm -hmm. You know, that's an active premise. It suggests a beginning, middle, and end to your story. No matter what form or format, whether it's a, a commercial, whether it's a, a TV show, a movie, a, you know, a book, these elements need to be there. Uh, and they all stem from your character and whatever journey or conflict that they were uh, uh, sent down. Uh, I, I, when I worked for my uncle many years ago as an intern, which means you don't get paid, and I got to hang out with these amazing writers, one of them a fellow named Eric Berkovich, and they'd all gather together like at the, 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 the lunch table like it was the Algonquin, you know? The, the Algonquin was an incredible hotel in New York. Yes. Where, was it uh, uh, Parker? Um, uh, Dorothy Parker, Dorothy Parker Hemingway, Fitzgerald, yeah. Would, would hang out at, yes. He gathered around, he, he told the story of this young exec at a studio who, very much, you know, wanted to, to, to make a big score with his first movie, so he, he, he locked himself in his screening room. He had uh, them run all the, the great movies, you know, Academy Award winning movies, and he emerged, and he gathered his writers together, and he said, I have found the secret to all great movies. Okay, what is it? And he goes, conflict! <laughs> so, uh, yeah, that's... That's what you need. Always. Always. In writing and in acting. You gotta know what you're playing, and you gotta know why you're, you're there, absolutely. I mean, a lot of times when I'm talking with writers, I'll, uh, they'll write a scene or they'll write some dialogue, and I'll just say, what am I supposed to tell the actor they want in this scene? Because I don't see it. There is a magic, an alchemy, that simply occurs in our, in our business, which is that moment where you get a great story, a great script, and then you cast it. And it is in that casting where the magic happens. Uh, it just, it is, it's, it's something you just got to know or feel. Um, it's why I hate casting. Really? Oh, well, if it's my work especially. Because I'm listening to all of these actors come in, most of them really good, and my work sucks. It's not funny, it's depressing, and I go, okay, they're gonna find out I don't know what I'm doing, and then that one actor walks in, and it's funny, and it's entertaining, and I'm going, oh my God, I'm a genius. That's the collaboration, isn't it? It's completely the magic of, of the right actor and just channeling the role. As you were breaking down the different um, job descriptions of a writer on a sitcom, you mentioned the story editor. So, in as the story editor, do you edit the writing? What is the function of a story editor? Well, again, the simplest way to think about it is everybody's a writer in TV. Mm -hmm. For the most part. There are non-writing producers, but everybody is a writer. Uh, we are all doing story editing at any given moment. Okay. It's really just a way of, of creating a chain of command. Okay. It's that So it simple. has nothing to do with the actual editing well, of the script. There is a distinction, usually. Um, everything's been blended or, or, or you know, uh, it's less defined. But usually when you are a story editor, you're working on other people's scripts, you're helping with the development of it, you're doing rewrites, um, but you're not doing editing and you're not doing casting. Okay. When you become a producer, then you tend to get into produce uh, okay. the, those other functions. And how did you get into directing as a writer? How did, how did It was late in the career. Uh, I was working with Jim Brooks on Phenom at the time. He was doing his movies, so he would just come for run-throughs and give me notes on some of the uh, edits, some of the reading. Uh, after watching me work on the floor and then seeing what I did in, in the edit room with the shows, he said, you should try your hand at uh, directing. I said, okay. So I gave myself the last assignment of the year and directed that episode. I wish I'd given myself an easier episode, but uh, it was the last one, and it went pretty well, and I was utterly dependent on 
uh, my crew. I think it made me a better showrunner, made me a better writer, because for the first time I'm sitting down there on a set and I'm getting pages from my writer's room. I'm looking at them going, what the hell do they want me to do now? The actors are confused, the crew is going, how are we going to do this or that? And it, it just, it was, it was, it was a, uh, it was, it was a great experience. Would you suggest that all writers um, direct a piece just to get the feel of what what it entails to put their words up on its feet? Yeah, it's a, if you can get if you can do it, great. But you don't have to. Not required. It's okay. a whole. Uh, it's just not. It's a whole other thing. You know, when, um, I tend to think visually, uh, right that way. Um, so. Uh, it was it was sort of natural for me. Uh, others, you know, they the writers are are not oriented in that okay. fashion. Other writers are much more uh, dialogue or story. You know, it just it's it really is where you're, where it takes you. The thing about this business is is that, yes, you need one person in charge, one person who, you know, you can oversee everything and can be blamed. <laughs> Uh, but you require an incredible amount of collaboration to make it work. It's like building a house. Mm. As a writer and then producing, what do you love about producing? Because doesn't it take you away from writing? Yes, that's what I love about it. Oh. <laughs> so you're the showrunner. Yeah. And then you just check on people to make sure they're writing? Is that is If that I'm that doing works? my job, yes. Okay. I love producing because it... It, 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 it allows me to stretch all the muscles. It allows me, you know, to, to um, uh, not just come up with the idea, but develop the script, but then to cast it. Uh, when I drew, when I, when I, when I did Sweet Life, the, the art director comes up and he says, basically, what do you want the set to look like? I often tell writers, you know, think like directors, you know, I mean, it drives me nuts when you're, you, you write something and they're sitting on the couch and the next thing is he takes a tomato juice out of the refrigerator. Well, how the hell is the director going to get him over to the refrigerator? You know, think in terms of entrances and exits. Where's the point of attack on the scene? You know, where are you coming in? You know, uh, all of these things you get to initially stretch when you're writing the script. But then when you get to sit down like with the art director and say, okay, here's where my entrances and exits are, I, I drew the basic map mm -hmm. of what I wanted that lobby to, to look, look like. like. Yes. And then he brings it back. And there's nothing better. It's just such a great feeling that you can say to people, I want this, and they bring it to you. Well, that's the nice part about uh, being the exec. You get to cast it. Uh, you also then are down on the stage, you're giving notes to your director about how you want it shot. No, I don't want the camera there, I want it over here. No, don't, you know, I need a cut here for this single, make sure I've got it. And then you get to go into editing and do the editing, which is the last rewrite. Make no Very mistake. Very well put. It is the last Very rewrite. Very well put. When I was working as an intern with my uncle, uh, he went in on a Saturday to re-edit. This one, they had those movieolas. He went in to re-edit something because the star, this guy named Michael Parks, he was a, right. a James Dean wannabe. Mm -hmm. So he went, Mom, will every line like this, and you couldn't understand anything that he was saying. Or just, you know, please, come on, talk. So my uncle went in. He, he had graduated UCLA film. He re-edited the film with the thrown over his shoulder, running the movieola, so that all the angles were changed where we needed to loop the dialogue. So we were on his back as much as possible. Wow. And that's when I went, oh, you can do a lot in editing. Yes, you can. And so uh, that, that's the other thing you get to do. And that is the joy of being an exec producer. Uh, when I did Sweet Life, we had a uh, little, what, a Jaden Smith, uh, Will Smith's kid mm -hmm. on the show. He had just... Uh, he had just done this movie with his dad, and I was getting dressed one morning, and he was being the interviewed. The Pursuit of Happiness. Yeah, he was being interviewed on, on, on Good Morning America, and they said, did you like doing the movie with your dad? And he said, yeah, yeah, I did. You know, well, what do you want to do next? And he said, well, I'd like to be on The Sweet Life of Zack and Cody. <laughs> and I went, oh. I picked up the phone. I called the agent. I said, uh, I called my producer. I said, 
Jaden Smith wants to be on The Sweet Life, tell him I'll write a role for him. That's both the beauty of being a showrunner, that you can do that yes. in that moment, yes. right? And then he came and he did the show. Well, the point of the story is, Will hung out on the set the entire time with his kid. And so we got a chance to talk. And he, of course, had done Fresh Prince, and now he was a big movie star. And I asked him, I said, what do you like better, Will? Movies or TV? And he said, oh, that's a tough one. He said, the thing about TV that I love is that you are like doing a high wire act. You start on a Monday with a script. You rehearse it all through the week. You make it better, you rewrite it, and you just work it until you've got it right. And whether you've got it right or not, come Friday night when that audience is in there, you shoot it. And sometimes it's through the roof, and it's a great high. Other times you go, thank God we're coming back next week and we get to do it all <laughs> over again. And he said, there was nothing quite like that ride. And I would agree with that. But movies, he said, you can work it. You can really work every scene till you mm -hmm. get it right. Um, and that, that was a great joy to be able to perfect something like that. Of course, with his movies, he's got the budget to do that. Others, but it was a great point right. that that was part of the excitement. Right. Uh, of doing TV is that you get to keep doing it over and over again. And so as the exec, I get to be a part of all of that. Um, and I get to delegate. Today we have an extraordinary comedian slash author slash writer, amazing person. And I am just so excited to introduce him to you because he is a phenomenon. Please help me welcome Daryl Littleton Sr. Yeah. Hey, Daryl, how, <laughs> how are, are you? you? Good to see you. Long Good. Time. Going through your comedy career was BET the first show you started writing for or because uh, you said you had written for a lot of the comics who were hosting right uh, BET were you a staff writer at that time when I uh, started writing freelance for DL uh, when he left that's when I got the job writing there for Cedric and to Cedric's credit because it doesn't really matter right now Cedric had another writer and me and Cedric had worked on the road together, so we were friends. We were cool, uh, comedy friends. Always got to distinguish, you know, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. life friends and your your yes, work friends yes. and your colleagues and all that. So we were good comedy friends. We had, we had toured together, and he said, "Well, D, I'll be honest with you. I really don't need a writer because I got my guy who write for me. But I'm not going to tell them that. I'll let you still keep the job, and then you do your thing, and then we'll tell them, yeah, he wrote it, and it doesn't really matter." And so that's what was cool about uh, him. Then when Cedric left, Samora came in, and me and Samora weren't really that familiar. I'd worked with her before. We did a competition together. We didn't have that kind of camaraderie, so I could come and say, let me just get my money, and you you do your own thing. Don't worry about me. Just I'll be over here kicking it. No, uh, I had to write for some more. That's when BET came to me and just said, well, we're getting ready to fire you. <laughs> it's like, well, why? Well, because all you do is write. And I said, well, what else do you need me to do? You hired me as a writer. It's like, yeah, but we need all hands on deck. This is BET. We need writers and producers. It's like, well, I can produce. And it's like, yeah, okay. And I said, no. I mean, and, I'm, and I almost said it's like, it's comic view. We're, we're not talking about a David Lean movie. This isn't you know, Lawrence of Arabia or nothing. I mean, come on. It's comic view. I mean, so they had the guy. His name was Bob Higgins. He showed me how to do it. And he said, I'm going to go to lunch, leave you with an editor, put together a show, and then I'll take a look at it when you get back. None of them knew that I had done a public access show called uh, Dare You to Laugh. And this was back in 1988 when I first started comedy. Six weeks as a comic, I'm doing public access TV. And then I produced my own show back in 1990 called Comedy on the Edge. It was Jamie Foxx's first TV appearance. It was D.L. Hughley's first TV appearance. Ronaldo Ray was on that show. The Lady Vet Wilson was on it. I had Pootie Tang on the show. I, had to, like, I did 10 episodes. And I produced it not knowing anything about how to produce a show except what I had seen already done. I uh, produced it, I got the space, I got the camera crew, my director was also an editor, we would shoot, I'd go over to his place, we edited it, I uh, did the credits, I knew exactly what I wanted, I told him which shots to keep in and keep out, I went and had to rent chairs, rent the space, and get an audience in, so mine was more 
hands-on producing. BET was walking apart because they already had a formula there. I didn't have to do anything but look at the footage and decide where I wanted stuff to go. And because I had comic timing, I knew how to get out of a joke before you keep that extra second mm -hmm. in there that blows the mm -hmm. joke. Mm -hmm. And so when he came back, he looked at it and he laughed and he said, I don't have to teach you anything. Yeah, okay, you're a producer now. And he said, man, this is going to make my life so much easier. And it did. Because mm. they gave me, because he was producing Comic View and the best of Comic View. His name was Bob Higgins, really nice guy. Uh, but they ended up giving me the best of Comic View. So I was able to do like hundreds of shows, um, pretty much unsupervised. And I was able to learn on the job. And it's like, wow, I did this. And I was able to experiment with stuff. So production came pretty easy for me. After that, you started getting more work as a writer for other comics. Right. You started doing shows, n late night shows. Did you start writing for late night shows? There was a late night show that Teddy Carpenter had done, and I can't remember the name of it. it right now, Tribune had picked it up. He did two pilots, and like, Paul Mooney was the head writer, and Buddy Lewis was another writer, and we had a, a couple of white guys. I can't remember their name, unfortunately. But they were every, it was a good writing crew. But what happened was... Tribune greenlit the show, and then Tribune changed over their front office or their head office. And Teddy was act. This was after Arsenio, but before the Magic Hour, before Keenan, before Vive. Mm -hmm. So it was right in that slot mm -hmm. where the public was really dying for another black late night talk show host. And uh, we had written some good stuff for him and all that. And Teddy was a great host. He really was. But he also had a great ego. He acted as though he'd already got the show. Because even though it was greenlit, we hadn't shot it. Right. We hadn't gone into production. <laughs> you know, it was all talk. And so we hadn't shot anything, but he was going around like, oh, Big Bang Hank, and I've been, you know, I'm Johnny Carson, and, you know, I've been here for ages. And it's like, but you haven't. We haven't done anything. And so the new regime coming in, we're not as enamored with this new egotistical personality they would have to deal with. And I think they gave him an ultimatum. He said, ah, screw you. And uh, so they said, we're not going to do the show. How about that? <laughs> How about that? We're just not going to do it. And you had to hear this from the grapevine because I forgot who it was. I think me and Buddy were in communication. And Buddy said, man, I heard we ain't going to do it. Teddy acted up. <laughs> it's like, what do you mean Teddy acted up? Yeah, yeah, they don't, don't want to do it with Teddy. And that was that. Wow. And that happens in TV a lot. I've had that happen a lot. And when did you decide you wanted to write books? I had gone overseas, and I came back. And I had done a lot of stuff over in Asia and Europe. And I came back and found out Were you doing military bases? Military bases. Okay. Yeah. And I found out that a lot of comics didn't know anything about the history of comedy. Because at the time, a lot of athletes were talking about how basketball players weren't what they used to be because they didn't know the fundamentals. Everybody was just flying through the air, and they weren't really doing, you know, what they used to. And it's like, and I'm thinking, well, it's the same kind of thing with comedy. And then I started talking to some comedians, and there's a comic that you would both know, both and I, you and I know, very prominent, and I asked him about Burt Williams, and he said he never heard of Burt Williams. And I said, oh, okay. And, you know, that kind of like lingered. And I wrote a book about the black comedy boom. That was the original thing I was writing about. They didn't know, the literary people I took it to, they didn't know who Jamie Foxx was at the time prominently. Uh, they didn't care about Cedric or Aries Spears or any of the Comics fledgling from that, stars. From that period. Right. Yeah. They didn't give a, a dog gone about them. And so my manager slash lawyer, they knew about their peers. And some people like to like comedy star with Martin Lawrence or uh, Eddie Murphy at, at the earliest. So, and I, I ran across senior comics who did not know about a lot of comedians that went before them. So the agent, June Clark, and out of New York, she said, well, if you're willing to write a book on the history, because it's obvious you know the history of comedy and you know the personality. If you're willing to write a book on the history of black comedy, I can get you a book deal. Okay, sure. So I wrote up, a, she had me write up a treatment, and she took it, she shopped it. Three publishers wanted to do it. One just wanted me to write about the 70s, just, you know, the whole 70s sitcom and all that. One wanted me to do, like, a thing like the Harlem Renaissance, but the one said, do the full history. And so I asked her, it's like, well, this is my first real book. What laws or what rules do I have to go? She said, this book has never been written before. You can do whatever you want. Freak it out, have fun with it, do whatever. And I was like, okay. You, you got the right guy for that because I don't know what I'm doing. 
So you're giving me a whole uh, paintbrush kit and you're giving me a canvas, but you're not saying paint in this line, paint in that line. No, you said do whatever you want. Go with the laws of a book. You pick up a book and just see where this goes and that goes and that goes. But as far as the content, that's all on you. I remember my, my lawyer wanted to get involved because he felt he could help me out because he was a cool dude. And <laughs> he said, I can help you. I can help you with the writing. And it's like I said, okay, well, what do you know about the history of black comedy? He said, well, I know a few things. I said, well, who is Clero? And they said, I don't know. It's like, okay, you can't help me. That, that was like litmus test. Clero was Flip Wilson's real name, and I don't expect most people to know that, but if you're a comedy historian, you should know, you that. Should know that. She got me the deal with Hal Leonard and Applause. So this is the book, Black Comedians on Black Comedy, a most amazing book on the history of African American comedy. Chris Rock had something to do with that name, and he doesn't know it unless he watches this, you'll never know. The name of the book was called Ham Bones to Hummers, and I was interviewed, I interviewed 125 comedians. I would go to some people's houses and restaurants. Me and Arsenio went out and ate. I was going around the Laugh Factory and the Improv a lot because comics hung around there, and I had interviewed Tony Rock. And so Chris Rock came pulling up in a car, and it was a convertible, I think. And I asked him, could I interview him for this book I was doing on the history of black comedy? And he said, well, man, I just came to see my brother and show him the new car. I mean, you know, it's like, well, it's only going to take a minute, man. I just need to ask you a couple of questions. What's the name of the book? And I said, Ham Bones to Hummers. And he said, man, I don't want to be involved in no book named Ham Bones to Hummers. <laughs> <laughs> and, and so, and they went in the club. <laughs> And that was it. He he would not let me interview him if the book was named Am Bones Thomas. I remember I, I, I cornered him like a couple of uh, days later, and he said, man, you ain't going to leave me alone. Is this what my life has come to? I just want to come out and have a good time. Answer a couple of questions then. <laughs> So he answered a couple of, <laughs> just answered a couple of questions and I, I explained to him, it's like, dude, Dick Gregory did the introduction of this book. I've interviewed our senior, I've interviewed Eddie Murphy. Uh, if you're not in here, Chris, it'll be like, what, I hate Chris Rock? I don't like Chris Rock? You're a vital person in comedy right now, in black comedy. And so I need to, you know, I need to talk to you. And he said, man, if all them other people have done it, I right, did. So he went ahead and, and he, he let me get him on for a couple of questions. Yeah, but he did not like ham bones to hummers. And then the sales department of the uh, publisher said, well, it's a funny title, but nobody's ever going to find your book. Because when they look for black comedy, they are not going to type in ham bones. And they said you should, with any book you do, and this is a free for anybody that's doing a book, put what the book is about. The book's about black comedians. I said, well, the book's about black comedy. It's about black comedians. They said, why don't you make that the title then? That's why it's called Black Comedians on Black Comedy. That way, if you type in black comedians, you get that book. Type in black comedy, you get that book. How to be funny is named How to be funny because I want people to, I wonder how can I be funny that by this book. So, so I learned that lesson. This was your first book. That was the first one. This book became a documentary. What was the process for you when she did the book? I had a uh, manager at the time, and he had made the deal with Code Black Entertainment. They wanted to do the book as a documentary. And then me and the manager broke up. I didn't know who the deal was with. He had told me, yeah, I got a deal for you. And then we <laughs> parted ways. It was like, you know, your ex-lover, you want to tell him, where'd you stash the money? <laughs> I'm not going to tell you anything. So yeah, I couldn't ask the guy, well, who's the deal? With? He didn't worry about the deal no more. Fortunately for me, Code Black was tenacious enough that when I got a new manager, they tracked him down, offered him less money, and made the deal. You got a deal with Code Black mm -hmm. to make a documentary. Then the process began. Yeah. Were you included in the process, or were you just... Yeah, initially, um, everybody was included in the process. We met with Code Black, and uh, it was uh, Code Black had let me know that they had secured Robert as the director if I went with them. And there was another offer on the table was with the uh, Wolper Corporation. He used to make all those uh, movie of the week for ABC. Mm -hmm. David Wolper. David yes. Wolper, and his son had taken over. Robert was the deciding factor, to be quite honest, because I was going to go with Wolper, but then they said, well, we got Robert Townsend. It's like, okay. Code Black and uh, Robert and I, we all sat down and figured out how they wanted to do it and who was going to contact the talent and who was going to write it and this, that, and the other. And at the time, I was touring with Cat Williams. At the time, Robert was shooting a movie. This is interesting. 
um, Robert had uh, gone over everything, and he had turned his notes over to an editor, who I think was contracted by Code Black, so I'm not going to blame Code Black for this. And the editor called me up, and Robert was off shooting a movie, and I was layover from the uh, tour, and the editor said, hey, can we meet for lunch? I want to talk to you about the project. Okay, sure, why not? So he said, Robert gave me these notes, and man, I I've always been a big fan of Robert Townsend. I just wanted to show him what I could do. And so I, I went and did, you know, all this extra stuff and all that, and he don't like it. <laughs> and no, what happened was Robert ripped him a new one because he told him specifically what to do. And then the guy went off rogue and did his own thing, and that was not according to the notes that he had. And so he's calling me now to try to smooth it over to Robert. It's like, but I know you and Robert are cool. It's like, yeah, but if he told you what to do, we're not that cool. That's between you and him at this point. I mean, I appreciate the lunch. You know, as I said, as I, mm -hmm. <laughs> no, no, I can't help you, man. I mean, you know, that's between you and Robert, but, uh, you know, thanks for the grub. Uh, and I just had an editor to do that to me. Sometimes editors go rogue and they just, they do, they're trying to impress you, but it, the thing is, just do the job. That's what right. Really they don't know who's me. in charge, so they're thinking they could play one side against the other. Yeah. What I will say about this book and the documentary, having been part of the documentary yes. myself from the beginning to the end, right? Of being the last woman standing on it. Yes. You um, are. <laughs> when everybody else got fired, was for me the process was probably the most amazing and exciting time I've ever had uh, working on a project because once all the interviews were shot and we secured, you know, uh, got whoever we were going to get and did all of that and then the staff was down to me. I mean, they fired everybody they and fired I was everybody. the only one. About nine, ten months, I was researching all the footage. Wow. That was all my work. Okay. You know, I and went. I did not know that. Oh yeah, I I would go to the Paley, the Paley so, Center. The yes. Over there. Okay. So I would go there maybe twice, three times a week, and just go through all comb wow. all the old footage from Johnny Carson yeah. to Mike Douglas wow. to um, that was serious. Everybody. Research. Yeah. And then I then there was another place here in the valley that had all these old bootleg movies of okay. all these black comics of the time and I would comb through all of that and wow. it was like going to comedy college. Yeah. yeah. It was so exciting. I, I have to tell you I was I in that. joy every day, every day. I was like, oh, my God. And I get to look at this, and I get paid for it, too. Right. And, and, and all then, the people you discovered. Yeah, and, yeah. Then, and then trying to figure out, then it was like, okay, now out of all this gold. What do we use? What can we pay for? Because right. it wasn't what can we use. Yeah. What can we pay for? And during the researching of, uh, of the documentary, was when I discovered the Fair Use Act because we were trying to get Amos and Andy mm. uh, footage from Amos and Andy right. and CBS would not give it to us because they had put it away since the 50s and right. nobody was going to have access to it. And I had gotten a bootleg. Actually, okay. I had a few of them. It was like, we need this piece. We got to have this piece. So then I found out about fair use and as long as it was under a minute right. and it was for educational purposes, you, you could do it. it. So yeah. like, so I, I was so excited. I was like, okay, so here's what I learned. Wow. It was yeah, because if it's less than a minute, yeah, you can yeah, use it. if it's for educational purposes, mm -hmm. you know, and this was definitely for educational right, purposes, not for pure profit, or right? Whatever, but you yeah. know, it's like here's the history. We need this. This is a piece that can't, you know. And you had to, and and in fair use. Not that I'm a, a lawyer or anything, but what I did learn was you have to make a case why yeah. it fits educationally. So I was able right. to to say, well, this is why, because this and this and this and this. I thought those were cold black employees that had done that. No, all man, time. that was me. Wow. I did all of that. And, and wow. there was a wonderful uh, woman from the post house, Dana. It was me and her. You know, I would bring her the stuff and then she would see what we wow. could use. And she was phenomenal. That is so impressive. But yeah. but yeah, everybody, I would say probably within a month of having had a staff, 
we were reduced to me. After we shot everything, like people started getting fired early, yeah, right? Yeah, people did. As soon as the um, interviews were shot, everything was completely shot and there was nobody else to interview, everybody was let go. I do remember that. I do yeah, remember every, everybody was let go. We, we, we were uh, told to get out the office. And I remember <laughs> Quinn, Quincy kind of took over the reins to a degree of being a co-director. Yes. It was a tremendous learning experience because you see how intellectual property, how mm -hmm. um, creative decisions get um, commandeered. And at the end of the day, it's about who's paying the bill. Exactly. Because uh, there were like three versions of that movie. One was God awful. And I, I know you didn't have anything to do with that. <laughs> and one Robert did, which I know you probably did have because there was a lot of research that had been done in it. Uh, do you remember the Robert version? Oh, of course. Okay. That was Academy Award winning stuff. It was, it was, it right. was beautiful. But it, it was masterful. Right, but it was not about art. It was about ego. You know, it, it was about, I want to do this. They wanted to bring in the academia to uh, discuss the history yeah, and I want to, to make it a little high. So we had these talking heads. We had people that really didn't know comedy talking about comedy, and so so it became a, a different thing. But the, the wonderful final thing, version was okay. Yeah, the, the, final the version came out fine. At the end of it, it's still a piece that I'm proud of. Me too. You know, Me too. it's still a piece that. It, it, but you know, I guess it's like anything else. The reason I even bring up Robert's version was I didn't feel there was any interference on that at all. I think that was just him pure. Yeah, that was his in. stuff. That was yeah. His stuff. Robert and I had discussed like halfway through the project that we wanted to get an Oscar for this because it was in the document. It would be in the documentary category. We knew in most documentary categories, not all films are American. However, the voters in the Academy are mostly American. So we knew there was a lot of swing. We knew it was a black comedy, which people weren't familiar with in that degree, but it was still a popular uh, genre that we could mess around with. And we had pitched, uh, we, we had some ideas, and, and Robert had pitched one to uh, one of the execs, and the exec didn't like it. <laughs> and um, then it became a thing of ego and hubris and all that. Like I said, it depends on who's writing yeah, it's the about, check. Yeah, it's about the money. It, yeah. uh, you know, and, that was, and that was a really important lesson for me to learn, just mm -hmm. in general, because whoever has the money has the power. And it doesn't matter who the talent is. If the, the person controlling the purse strings says, I want blue, you're going to have blue. It's going to be blue. That's how it is. Yeah. I, I am grateful that you wrote this book. Let me tell you. Me uh, not only because it is so incredibly um, informative and it really takes us through the history of black comedy, but it's through the eyes of black comedians. Right which is unheard of, which is wonderful. And then to have the documentary as an accompaniment yeah. for it, which, you know, we were very fortunate. We got fortunate. wonderful people to talk and... Yeah, and, and we had, um, geez, Maxine Waters and uh, Michael Eric Dyson and uh, Cornell West. My favorite. And we had he Diane was exercising Parhesia. Yeah, right, right, right. <laughs> Well, we had Diane Watson, we had Queasy yeah. and Fumi, we had a lot of major, yes. so it wasn't like we went to Washington, because it was at the uh, Congressional yes, Black Caucus. Yes, I remember. And it was the year that uh, Barack was, and we almost got Barack on camera. We almost got him, but everybody was swarming, and you know, because I would have loved him to say, I love black comedy, because that would have been the tag on the documentary. But the bottom line is, it came out well, but the lesson I saw when Robert did his version is, when you're untouched, you can actually do it any way you want. And the reason I, I only was going to write that one book, I've written seven others. And what made me keep doing it was, unlike stand-up that I can shoot on TV and you can cut a joke out if you don't like it, unlike radio where you can pull me out or, or put me in or whatever. Unlike any collaborative art, when you write a book, it's you. I was lucky with my first publisher, but then I, I wrote other books, and I was fortunate because uh, with the other books, I self-published. This is a book that should be at colleges and universities. It was taught at USC. Because I think this book should be in every uh, college and university, especially if they have uh, black departments. Right. That they should pick up this book and teach it to your students so that they not only know the political side of black history, but the 
artistic comedic side of black history because it is necessary it is important and we need it i do have two other books these are okay. this is my collection okay so daryl's got a book called how to be funny and if you want to be a comedian or comedic writer you should know this book this is something you should pick up and get i recommend it and my favorite comedians yes. Laugh, be a lady. I'm not saying this because I'm in it, although I am. I am saying this because, it, again, it is a wonderful um, informational book about uh, female comedians. Something for you to get. And there is another one coming out. Guess who's going to be in the book? Hot and Spicy Mamitas. Ah, that's right. It's fantastic. And now, so th this is uh, four books. And right. you, you have... I've written uh, seven have been published. Okay. And that one, the last one you held up, um, This Day in Comedy, will come out December 3rd, and that's the Ethnic Encyclopedia of Laughter. So that covers um, African American, Latin, Asian, uh, Native American, and Middle Eastern. It's the first comedy encyclopedia. Wow. I did not know that. When I when I went in and I just said, well, we'll call it an encyclopedia. And then I looked it up, and there's never been a comedy encyclopedia. Wow. And yeah. what are the other four books that you the have The other out four there? books, one is, uh, the second book I did was a book called uh, Pip Down, The Rise and Fall of Cat Williams. And I was advised not to do that book. Even though if you read the book, it's not a slam of Cat Williams. I want to write a book about fame, because I write about themes. I don't really try to write the specific personality stuff. I wanted to write a about fame, but that's such a broad, you, you can throw that out there all day and nobody's going to go run out and buy it. So you wrote a book on Cat Williams. Right, right. A lot of people thought I was going to try to slam Cat and all that. I had known Cat for, when I wrote the book, I had known him for 10 years, if not more. And, and you have uh, been writing with him. Yeah, mm -hmm. uh, we met in Oakland and when he came down here, he used to host the uh, Hollywood Park Casino when he'd go on vacation or the road he had me fill in for him. So we were cool. We were friends in the sense of that. The book I wanted to write was about fame and I really didn't want to write about a specific individual but since I'd worked with Cat and you're talking about a guy who was living in the back of a U-Haul truck, no teeth, no prospects and all that, to rise to be a comic. When I was working for him he was making $125,000 per show. So that is a huge gigantic yes. leap yes. in yes. your life and you, if you're talking about fame, then you would have to chronicle somebody like that because that first-hand knowledge of what he did and all the pitfalls and all that. So I wanted to talk about how rapid fame, what to be aware of. Also, a lot of people think they want to be famous, but the reality of fame is totally different than what you imagine it to be because, number one, you can't shut it off. You can't wake up one day and be famous and people digging through your trash and asking a bunch of personal questions and tomorrow I want to be unfamous and they leave you alone like it was back in the days where you could ride the bus or go shopping for yourself without anybody bugging you. I want and, to point and also the enormous responsibility that comes with fame. There is a tremendous amount of responsibility. Every time you open your mouth, yes, you, you are probably quoted. And if you're misquoted, you should be able to try to clean that up because the truth is like right there at the surface. But a lot of people don't know how to handle it, and that's why a lot of people become drug addicts or alcoholics or fame can accentuate whatever is the bad problems, about you. Yes. Or it can bring out the good in you because now, if you're a humanitarian type of personality, that fame can be used for good. But if you honestly believe your own hype, then it's probably going to be used destructively because you're going to be trying to talk down to people and all that. That was not a uh, catch problem with me. What I saw was how people just kind of pulled out the chapstick and just cut, started kissing just a lot of butt. And acting like they had known the guy for ages and all this. And then how quick that the people who hoist you up are so quick to want to, you know, pull the legs out from under you and rip you down. So I talked about the Beatles. I talked about Freddie Prinze. I talked about a lot of people who were famous beyond Cat. But I knew if you come up with a title of a popular person at the time, people would run out. And they did. They, they ran out and they bought that book like really quick and wholesale before somebody bootlegged it, which is bound to happen with a book, you know, with a pimp in the title. I did another book, which is one of my favorite books. I wanted to do something about the American Revolution, and I had always heard that uh, some of the presidents actually had been had black blood in them. 
Now, I knew Warren Harding did. I heard Lincoln did. I heard Jefferson did. I, you know, you hear all these rumors. I wanted to do something that was funny, though, with the American Revolution. So I have Forefathers, and Forefathers is about Thomas Jefferson really being a black guy, and they hired a white guy to play the white uh, Thomas Jefferson that we see. <laughs> The real Thomas Jefferson, who did the legislature and the Declaration of Independence and all that, but he was black, and that's why you have that's the artist hilarious. painting the white version. Yeah, this is my comic book. This is my graphic novel. Oh, wow. Yeah. And then you put a CD series Yeah, I was called a, uh, Black and Blue. I was approached by uh, the people who bought Laugh Records, and they knew that I had produced stuff. And uh, they said, would you produce this uh, CD collection of party records? And so tell us what party records are. Uh, party records are joke records that you, if you grew up or listened to Red Fox just telling jokes or um, Mantan Moreland or uh, Rudy Ray Moore, more than likely Dolomite, if you grew up listening to Dolomite or, or Slappy White or uh, LaWanda Page. Uh, Leroy and Skillet. Uh, Marshall Warfield is on this one. And maybe might not be familiar with Marshall Warfield. And, and, did party records. And, and they, party records were also a little dirty. Uh, uh, risque. Yes, risque. Yes. If you, back in the day, when you went and bought actual physical albums, you would go to the record store and um, you would order like a party record. You would say, yeah, give me Rudy Ray Moore, uh, Below the Belt. And they would order it for you, which is an actual title. And they would order it for you, and then you would go back to the record store, and they would have it in a brown paper, paper bag, bag. Right. and they would reach under the counter, right. and it's like, so you Jones? It's like, I'm Jones. <laughs> like, okay, we got your record. And then they would give you your record. Or they would have it in the back. Right, right. Yes. And you'd have to go back yes. and get it, and mm -hmm. then come and then give it to you in the bag. And once you got out of the store, you could take it out of the bag. But as long as you're in the store, no, you got to leave it in the bag because they did not have um, the stickers that we have now. The, the uh, what is advisories. It? Right, the advisories. Uh -huh. sticker right disclaimer yes and this is nasty yes and and it was illegal i believe you know that's why lenny bruce kept getting arrested right because his yeah. profanity was at that time not acceptable the way adults talk but that's not right in on public, stage that's right in a public setting that's right so I loved doing uh, Black and Blue. Black and Blue is available on Amazon. I loved doing it because they gave me like 20 hours of footage I had to go through. So it was like what you were talking about. I was so excited every day to get up. And it was the uh, summer of 15 or 14 that I did this and I couldn't get enough of it because then it, you listen to all of it and then it's like, so how am I gonna cut this down? And uh, because it was all funny to me, but then I would go for the stuff that, you know, timing wise in the sense of, some of it was really funny in the 70s, like, okay, you can get rid of all the Nixon jokes and get rid of, you know, jokes about politicians from the 70s. And then you just try to get down to like the really hilarious stuff. It's a five um, CD set, I think. Wow. And then I wrote uh, liner notes. They told me, yeah, just, you know, if you want to, you can write some liner notes. I wrote a fifth, I wrote 45 pages. It's a, it's a little mini book. Robert Townsend did the, uh, the forward for that. Yes. Yeah. I, I remember. I remember when he oh, was Oh, you remember doing when it. he was doing yeah, it? Yeah. yeah. I remember. Yeah. yeah, I was glad to have him do that because I knew he knew about all those people. Mm -hmm. You have touched a lot of different things with your comedy. Mm -hmm. You know, you have been able not only to do stand-up, but to write for people, to then write for shows, write books. Where do you want to go to with your career now? Where, what, what haven't you done that you would like to do? I want to be a preservationist. There's some books that I want to write, and I'm not going to bring those out right now because some are actually serious books. I don't want to just mm -hmm. stay totally in comedy. Mm -hmm. Like all comics, every comic wants to do a drama. Every musician wants to do comedy or drama. And so everybody uh, gears towards drama. What I do want to do is I want to be known not as a historian but as a preservationist. To me the difference is a historian chronicles. A preservationist tries to make sure that that I, I wrote a book and I don't have the uh, I didn't even do a print up of it it's called um, how to do stand up comedy preserving a dying art form mm. uh, people talk about internet comics right now I, I do want to touch on that real quick internet comics are nothing to fear uh, no more than the black comedy boom comedians were anything to fear no more than the socially uh, commentary comics of uh, Thea Vidal or AJ Jamal or Mario Joyner before the black comedy boom were anything to 
Shakespeare, no more than the joke tellers in black and blue. Everybody moved everyone out the way. And so I'm hearing comedians that came from the black comedy boom, my ear is saying, man, these internet comics are taking over. I just said, you mean the same way we took over? You mean the same way Mario Joyner and Theo Vidal came, took over from the joke tellers? You mean the, the way they took over from the minstrels? You mean the, everybody comes along and takes over. It's not supposed to, here's the deal. Comedy is the only art form with no school. It's still wild, wild. There's no rule or anything. Just like music, I was playing funk. All of a sudden, here came disco. I was obsolete. All of a sudden, here came uh, hip hop. Disco's obsolete. So everything, every art form is supposed to keep moving. If not, there's a real problem. And I know a lot of comics, for fear of internet comedians, are running out and getting day jobs. Well, that's not really the answer. Because art, you can't have an art form that survives if the people in the art form have day jobs. <laughs> I mean, quite honestly, I had a day job when I got into comedy, and since I've been into comedy, I've tried to keep it strictly comedy. I've really tried to, like, concentrate on that. So how do you recommend for comics who've been at it a long time to evolve? so that they don't get left behind and don't end up with a day job, but are able to keep their material fresh, keep, that's, you know. That's what you just said is the key word. You have to keep your material fresh. A lot of uh, comedians have their act and they just keep doing their act or derivatives of their act, their act, their act, their act. You have to grow. There were two great comedians. You had Richard Pryor and you had George Carlin. And it was always, it was never a question of who was number one, who was number two. It was always Pryor was one, Carlin was two. In recent years, others, including myself, look at Carlin as one and Pryor as two. The reason for that is Pryor was kind of like the Beatles. He did a hot 10 years that were blazing hot and then the rest of it was just kind of like former shell of what he was. Carlin stayed current from the time he was the hippy-dippy weatherman up until the, the seven words he couldn't say on TV, up until he was an old man, he was still relevant with what he was talking about. That's where I kind of want to go with this when I say I want to be a preservationist. and I just really want to stay current. The next thing that I want to do, me, I want to stay in book writing, and I want to do a book on the full history of comedy, and I'm talking about all the way from the caveman or when it first started all the way up to like yesterday without naming any names. Just the mm -hmm, history and mm -hmm. the evolution of that living organism called comedy. And yeah, we'll talk about vaudeville and we'll talk about the black comedy boom, we'll talk about minstrels, but I don't want to get into personalities because I've already done that with three books. Yes. I mean, I've broken everybody down. If you, if you want to know something else about them, go talk to their family. Because mm -hmm. if it ain't in these books, who cares? So now, um, I want to um, open up a Resurrection Boulevard. Okay. What was the inciting incident that got the idea for you? Well, um, I had written uh, um, a script, a pilot called La Reforma, which is my wonder years growing up in Tucson. And it helped me get a uh, whole high in the first script um, my first job uh, on a series, but it also, uh, when Showtime, Jerry Offsay at Showtime, wanted to do a Latino show. So Jerry Offsay was the head of Showtime at the time, and he was so generous yes. with um, uh, talent of color. He really nurtured yes. talent of color. Yes. I was, um, I met Jerry, uh, Debbie was at ABC, and Jerry was at ABCP, and then I did McKenna with Gil at ABCP, so Jerry Offsay and I became friends, and we would go play basketball. I was a good ball player in those days. We'd go play in the basement under ABC. There was a Spectrum Club under there, and it was Jerry Offsay and Mark Zachran who's, and, um, and uh, Gary Levine, who's now the president of Showtime, and uh, and uh, Mark Pedowitz, who is a CEO of CW, all these guys. And this this is the other thing that needs to happen. You need to um, uh, what would you call it? Uh, network uh, branch out. Network, network, and get to the closest people of power and people who are doing things and meet them and get an opportunity to meet 
everybody you can. And build relationships, because you build relationships. build relationships, relationships, and that's how I met Jerry Asse. And so Jerry went to Showtime. He wanted to do a Latino show. He started Soul Food. He started Queer as Folk. He wanted to service all the um, audiences that were underserved. Yes, he was doing Latinos. diversity. He was he was the master of diversity before there were any exactly. diversity programs. And he doesn't yes. he doesn't get enough credit. For, yes, Jerry is he, amazing. And Jerry had an, uh, an agenda to put a Latino show on the air. So I always teased him and Mark. <laughs> I go, they hired me because they didn't know any other Mexicans. <laughs> they only, because their gardeners were Japanese. I teach them about that. But um, uh, they hired me because I was the only Mexican they knew, really. Although, you know, not really. But the only Mexican writer they knew. And so I gave them La Reforma, and Jerry said, this is great, we love it. But it's not for Showtime because it's too sweet. So I took the family and I married, I was watching Showtime and the boxing match came on. And I married the show, the family drama with the boxing match and we got Resurrection Boulevard. Wow. Now I want to tell you why Resurrection is called Resurrection. Because there's some other people who think that, it, including, you know, well, I won't go into that. Um, they think it has something to do with Resurrection Gym, which is in East LA. It has nothing to do with Resurrection uh, Gym. It has everything to do with resurrection of the human spirit. It's a theme. I had written a short story years ago before Resurrection Boulevard called The Resurrection of Hercules Montana. And it's a very sweet story, but um, so, Resurrection has always been a theme with me, and that's why it's called that. But um, that's how I got Jerry wanted to do it, and so I went back to them. I pitched the boxing with the family drama and all these characters. BB is an is an amalgam of all my mom and her friends. And BB was Elizabeth Pena's role. Elizabeth Pena's role. All these um, uh, strong, feisty fiery Latinas that were just, you know, they didn't take crap from anybody. So you, you take the, you take Resurrection Boulevard and you pitch it to Showtime and now they buy it. Right. So what is that feeling for you? Uh, the, you have been a writer all this time, but now you have been bumped up to EP. Now you are the creator and now you're coming in as the executive producer. Right. I, I was a, a co-producer. I oh, was never you... a producer. I was a co-producer. Okay. And I never, and so then when they asked me to write the pilot, they were a little bit, I'm a, you know, I, I teased Zachary about this because he came back and he goes, wow, this is really good. I said, well, what did you expect? Did I turn into a piece of crap? And he goes, well, we didn't know. You're a young writer. We didn't know. And they loved it. And we and they gave it to me. They let me write it, produce it, um, do everything. But um, later, when we got the series, they said we want you to hire another EP who has worked on the series, so that we have a little bit of insurance and we we feel comfortable giving you a show of your own because you've never done it. I said okay, and that's where I got Bob Eisley. Isley came, I, he's been an old friend of the, our family for a long time, and so I said, Bob, come do this with me. And it sort of, it broke my heart a little bit because I I would have done it with Gil Grant because I love Gil dearly. He's one of my dearest people to me. And he taught me so much, and he gave me so much opportunity, but at that point, I needed to cut the apron strings. I needed to show everyone I could do this on my own. Otherwise, I ne they never, you know. So anyway, I brought Isley on, and Bob became my partner, and uh, and we did, you know, we put Resurrection on, on the air. So 
what was the casting process for you for the original characters because i mean uh, the thing about Resurrection Boulevard is that you hired almost every Latino actor in Hollywood. Everybody. Almost. Almost. almost except for in? me. Except for me. Almost did everybody. You? I didn't no, get no. to come in. No. Seriously. You never I didn't did get in. to come in and, and read for that. No. No. But. <laughs> but. No. Hey. Don't don't feel bad. Oh, no. I don't. I don't. I, I You know. Wait. No, wait. Stop. I don't feel You're in good all. company. There's all kinds of people coming after me still. I mean, I mean, uh, you interviewed Rick Nahanna. He's always giving me crap <laughs> about it. Uh, Jay Montalvo gives me crap about it. Um, all these guys who never got on the show. And I said, I only had, had three seasons. If we had four or five, six. You would have you to come on. But what come you on. did was, but what you did was incredible. I mean, because what you did was something we did not have. So you gave Latinos something to be proud of and something to, um, uh, you know, just talk shit about. Like, yeah, we got Resurrection Boulevard. So yeah. I, I, I think I get goosebumps uh, thinking of that because you really. Um, you really brought in everybody from young actors like Nick Gonzalez to um, uh, um, all, all these people. And my, my brain is going, but all these people. And then you brought in the, the elders. You brought in Rita Moreno. You brought in Henry Darrow. I mean, you really um, brought in excellence, you know, and it, it's Thank wonderful. You. It is. I, you know, I'm so proud of you. I'm proud of the show. I'm proud of the work that you've done with that, that you were able to do with that show. And so many actors were able to then go on and have really nice careers. Thank you. Thank you. Um, one of my proudest moments is when I got Elizabeth Pena together with Isai Morales and uh, um, Lou Diamond Phillips. They're all part of the family. And uh, I just, uh, you know, to have them all together again after La Bamba was just one of my best moments. And uh, I mean, yes, we worked with Rita Moreno and uh, uh, oh, uh, I could go on and on. And I just loved working with all of them. Ruben Blades. Uh, Did Ruben get to have a scene with Bibi? I don't I she may have come in the backyard because he plays a homeless person who Ruben then played by uh, Daniel uh, Zacapa uh -huh. he finds him out of the street and he brings him and lets him camp out in the backyard of the Santiago home and Roberto goes crazy he's like what are you bringing home homeless people for <laughs> and, uh, but Ruben turns out to be somebody who we don't expect and I, I love doing that with the show. We did that on most Americans. Yes. People you don't, you think they're one thing and they're really not that yes. at all. Yes. And, um, but Ruben plays, oh, you, and Henry Darrow, who played um, Manolito on High Chaparral and a million other things, uh, he was the grandfather with Rita, who was the grandmother. And, uh, uh, um, Hector Elizondo, I love Hector. Hector is the best. I Hector, I mean, Hector played I my do. father. Hector played my father on a TV movie called Honey Boy, which starred um, Eric Estrada. And he oh wow! Yeah, Hector was the <laughs> Hector taught me how to save stuff for camera. You know, because wow. we would be a, we would be rehearsing, and I would be crying and doing these emotional scenes and then at one point he came up to me and said save it for the camera just just talk it right. through and then do it when when the camera goes on and that was one of the best um lessons i got yeah no i i got the same lesson with lou diamond phillips um i shot a master a uh a, a, a wide um, when I was first, it's my second episode, but first starting to direct. And uh, now, did you I get to direct the first and second episode? No, 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 no. Jesus directed the pilot. Okay. 
the two-hour movie. Jesus Trevillo. Uh, just, just didn't, for clarity. I didn't direct the second and third season. Okay, but just for clarity, it was uh, it was Jesus Trevino. Yes. Okay. Jesus. Yes. And but um, when I started directing, I done the same thing because Lou, I'm shooting wide, and Lou is crying, and I mean, boogers are coming out of his nose. <laughs> I mean, he's. I mean, Lou Diamond Phillips is one of the best actors alive. He is fantastic, and people don't realize um, how good he is. And um, and then as we got closer and closer, he sort of ran out of fluid. So I learned that we should shoot the close-ups first and then go wide. So you learn that. Yes, Save yes. it for the camera. You're, you're, you're not taught that. Hey, so let, let me ask you, did, did yeah. Bob Marones never... Uh, Ask you to come in? Oh no, uh, uh, cause me and Bob had uh, uh, me and Bob got into it early on, cause Bob that's could be why, Bob that's could why be. That's why you're never on the show. Bob was Bob could be um a special one. He he was a little slimy, and I would call him out. You know, he would he would do some stupid shit, and I would call him out. So then he wouldn't call me <clears throat> for any of the projects he did. The la and then and then I would go and and make up and bring him a gift. I didn't apologize, but I would bring him a gift. And then <laughs> and then um, the last thing I I um, the last thing I auditioned for him for, and then that was it. Was um, uh, the Oliver Stone movie? Um, uh, oh, uh, uh, Salvador. I think it was Salvador. And what happened was um, Oliver Stone had had us come at 8 in the morning <coughs> for a general at 8 in the morning. Didn't tell us anything about the project, just wanted to meet people. So I get there at 8 in the morning, and it's like a busload of women come in. Maybe four of us were working actors and the other ones were people that Bob found at the mall, at the tennis court, <laughs> on the bus, at the bus stop, you know, just, so I'm sitting there and now it's like 9.15 and Oliver Stone comes out into the lobby, he's reading the paper, he's chatting with the reception, with the receptionist and we're still waiting and so now I'm starting to get a little annoyed because I'm like, wait a minute, first of all, this is like a cattle call almost in that they're bringing in everybody. Uh -huh. They're not, you know, it, it's bad enough as, as Latino actors, we don't get, um, Any respect. yeah. So now, so, so now I'm really, I'm, 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 I'm really getting revved up. I'm sitting there and I'm like, ah, oh. so I walk in and then I'm trying to calm myself down. I walk in, I hand, uh, um, Oliver stole my resume, my picture. He doesn't look at it. He doesn't look at it. He just looks at me. He goes, so do you speak Spanish? Well, that was the fuse that blew up everything. Because I said, if you would turn the, the resume, if you would turn the picture around, look at my resume, then you would know. And he said, why are you busting my balls? I said, because your balls need to be busted. You have me come here at 8 o'clock. It's now 9.30. And you don't even have the decency to look at my resume before you ask me a question? So that was it. So we we went we went off. It was like a, a, a fight. And then Bob called my agent and was like, you know, she disrespected me. And I was like, wait a minute. They disrespected me. It, it was like don't do that. You know, we're all artists. Treat us all with respect. So that was the last I went in for Bob. <laughs> that was it. <laughs> well, I would have cast you. Thank you, Dennis. I know you would. So that was my Bob Mahonis story. And and that was the other thing. I used to call him Bob Mahonis. So <laughs> we, we just did not. Um, yeah, he was, he and I. Well, I just... love Bob, but I know that he has his issues with actors. And so he only worked two seasons. The last season I got, um, Simon and Beth, uh, uh, Simon Ayers yes. uh, and Beth Heinzen. Yes, and they were wonderful. They were wonderful people. So 
let me ask you about um, because you had so many amazing actors on on Resurrection Boulevard, and one of them was the award-winning Lugasa Jr., who you had come in into the boxing um, right. uh, club. What was that for you? Because that must have been a big deal. Well, he's an Oscar winner, so I mean, it's a big time. It's like Rita walking in the on the set, and. Um, I just love Lou, and um, it's a funny thing. In the third season, um, when Lou came on, at the end of it, he's going. We need to. He came into my office, and he goes, "We need to go talk to Jerry Offsay and tell him we need another season." <laughs> and I, I thought, I thought, oh Lou, you're so great. Here he is. He's fighting for my show. Of course, it's his show then, and. Uh, he was so good. He was so good. He didn't have to act. He just showed up. And that's how good he was. Mm -hmm. And uh, I thought we created a good character for him as an old fighter who went to prison. And uh, because he was with a white woman. And uh, we don't tell that backstory, except sort of we allude to it. And uh, but that's that's what it was all about. And uh, he was just great. I loved him. And I how, still love him. And how was it working with Rita Moreno and Henry Darrow? Oh, my God. Henry is the best. Uh, Rita is the best. Uh, I remember Rita, we went to see her. She did a one-woman show at Pepperdine after we wrapped. And uh, she. we went to dinner, and she told me, she said, you are the best producer I've ever worked with. Oh. And I thought, I have I, I have made it. That's all I need is for Rita Moreno to validate me. That's all I need. And I thought, oh my God, Rita Moreno. And you, I think there's a picture that I sent you of me giving her a kiss at one of her shows. I just love her dearly. And she was so good as a grandmother. And Henry was so good as a grandfather. Um, uh, everybody was just, I mean, they're, they're wonderful. They're all wonderful. Yeah. I wish we could have had more uh, people. We had gone five, six, eight, ten seasons. What, what were a few of your takeaways from doing that show for you personally? All the people that I met is, you know, and subsequently met through the show. Um, I mean, obviously, people like you, who I love dearly. And then, um, uh, I mean, I got to meet, sometimes I think I'm like Forrest Gump because I've met so many people. I mean, Joe Frazier, uh, uh, Sugar Ray Leonard, uh, Carlos Palomino, I mean, you go on and on, all the boxers, all the world champions, all the people, uh, um, uh, Brian Austin Green was great, I mean, everybody. Uh, the takeaways, uh, I just, ha I've had a very special life, and um, I've done a lot of things, and not just, you know, producing shows, but I've been able to work in baseball. I've been a stuntman. I've been, um, I've done, I've done a lot. And then in Hawaii, I met all kinds of people. I mean, uh, Tim Matheson, who I met at, at Old Tucson, and then in Hawaii, and then he came. He wanted to direct an episode of Resurrection. Wow. And. Um, uh, we would have given it to him in the fourth year, but we got we didn't make it to fourth year. So um, when did you start? Uh, this is just a side note, but when did you start playing golf? Oh, I, my dad, and this is a great story. My dad said, when I was a, in junior high school, he said, you're going to learn two things. You're going to learn to type, and you're going to learn to play golf. He goes... Typing will serve you all your life, and golfing is what businessmen do. And lots of 
business is done on the golf course. So later on, I thought, I don't want to play golf. I do baseball and football and basketball. I don't, I, golf is like for sissies. And, I, and uh, but my dad said, you're going to learn to play golf. So I learned to play golf. And then when I was a senior, I needed two classes to graduate. And my dad said, have you taken typing? And I go, no. He goes, get a typing class. <laughs> so I was a senior in the, with all these freshman girls in typing. And what do I do now? I golf and I type. That's fantastic. My dad was like so prescient. He knew. He knew something. I don't know what the hell he knew, but he knew something. Yeah, he, he, was, he, he, he set you on the right course.